Good afternoon, everybody. We're not starting for five minutes, but Monmouthshire, in their wisdom, have decided to have a fire alarm practice at any time after two o'clock. You will not be needed to leave the room, but do not be alarmed. It is only a practice. Despite the clock at the back, it is two o'clock. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our February meeting of the Planning Committee. We're, the whole of the Planning Committee are here this afternoon, apart from my chairman, Ruth Edwards, who's at a funeral which she had to attend this afternoon. Could everybody in the room please switch off their mobile phones as it interferes um, with our electronic equipment? I'm Peter Clark, and I'm the vice chairman of the committee. To my uh, right is Councillor Roger Harris, uh, uh, opposition spokesperson. Uh, Denzel Turberville, solicitor. Philip Thomas, development services manager with the council. Craig O'Connor, head of planning. Andrew Jones, development management area manager. Amy Longford, heritage manager and applications team manager. Thank you all. Um, we go in uh, the sequence this afternoon. We take those applications where there are people who have come to this meeting wishing to address us, and we deal with those first, of which there are two this afternoon, out of the number of applications. And thereafter, we shall res resort to the, the sequence as the agenda is printed. The first item on the agenda this afternoon is for apologies for absence. And as I've already said, that is only Ruth Edwards this afternoon. Are there any declarations of interest? Other than when? Thank you. And the next item is to confirm the accuracy of the last meeting held here in December, which are on pages one to eight. Seconded. Any problems on those, anybody? No. And we go straight onwards, therefore, to consider the applications before us this afternoon. And as I said, we're taking them with people who wish to speak. 
in that sequence. And the first one is an application for the retention of a timber close boarded fence on the south boundary uh, at Jasper, Tudor, Crescent in Abergavenny. Um, and you're just going to take us through that, Andrew, please. Yes, thank you, Chair. So this is a household application for the retention of timber close boarded fence. Uh, and as the Chair has said, the raising of garden levels between 120 mil and 810 mil over the length of the fence. The site is located within the village of Landfoist and is set within a modern housing development. The application is before you today, members, at the request of the local ward member, Councillor Howard. Um, for the benefit of any members that weren't on site yesterday, just a couple of photographs um, for you to observe. This here is a view of the fence. This is taken from the neighbouring property, number 19, and this is show to the fore their fence and then behind that is the fence as it stands in situ on the application site and that's again taken from the the same neighboring property um, looking again at the fence to the rear subject of this application um, since the application has been submitted several amendments have been made uh, which include a reduction in the height of the existing fence and the proposed introduction of trellis fencing and planting. It's now proposed to reduce the solid fence to 1.3 metres in height and to install trellis panels above that would see the overall structure stand at 1.72 metres and if you can just, so that's a ex typical example there of the trellis panel and the next slide will show the fence that's along sort of taken along the southern boundary um, what is proposed to be amended uh, as is now before us um, so with regard to the detailed considerations there are three main issues to consider and two of which are of particular importance with regards to visual impact the fence in erected is between neighboring properties which is the prevailing means of enclosure of this type within the wider estate the word, works undertaken are largely only visible from within the application site and from the neighbouring dwellings at number 19 and 20, Jasper Tudor Crescent. And therefore, accordingly, in terms of impact on visual amenity, the amended scheme would require, with the requirements set out in policy DES 1. The significant issues for consideration today relate to land drainage and residential amenity. With regard to land drainage, I'll discuss the impact on the two adjoining properties, numbers 19 and 20, separately. Following correspondence received from the objecting third party uh, with regard to drainage issues at number 19, just to the present, the officers have engaged in consultation with James Woodger, who is part of our flood risk management team within the council. Whilst the advice from the flood team was that it was impossible to be certain, they did advise that there was a potential mechanism for the groundworks undertaken to be causing the problem or exacerbating an existing problem in respect of land drainage. It was proposed that the owners of number 21, the application site, install a French drain with shallow gravel filled trench in the garden of number 19, discharging into the surface water drainage system of number 19. As these works in part would have to take place outside of the red line boundary of the planning application and within land not within the ownership of control or the applicant, it was agreed that these works would take place prior to, to any decision being taken on this planning application as they could not have been controlled through planning condition. You'll see on screen is a cross section of the sol drainage solution um, I've just described there. These works were undertaken in December 2019, uh, and whilst they required no formal consent from the flood risk team, uh, they were inspected by the member from the flood risk team, James Woodyer, on site. Uh, however, it is noted that this has not resulted in the objection on this matter being withdrawn from number 19, who had anticipated that the drain solution would have included a land drain being laid along the grass area, the entire grass area um, of number 19 also. Um, therefore, whilst it's acknowledged that the drainage work did not include this, the council's flood risk uh, officer is satisfied that the works that were undertaken were sufficient to alleviate any detriment to the drainage system in the neighbouring garden caused by the unauthorised groundworks. 
Upon inspection, the, the engineer had confirmed that the new system was working well to remove water from the area around the wall. It is understood that the neighbour at number 19 has the right to remove or request the removal of the mitigation works. However, it's considered uh, on balance that the applicant, applicant has undertaken reasonable and appropriate works to mitigate any adverse drainage impact on third parties. The matter has been carefully considered in close consultation with the relevant technical expert within the Council's flood risk team. With regard to the impact on number 20, members on site yesterday will have seen the potential of ground being raised up against the neighbour's garage uh, and their damp roof course and boundary fence. However, it's considered that the updated conditions set out in late correspondence would appropriately mitigate this impact. Then finally, with regard to residential amenity, firstly, in respect of number 19, the fence as erected and as it stands in situ along the southern boundary does pose an issue with regard to being overbearing on the neighbouring property, uh, as well as, in part, obstructing the neighbour's right to natural light. Accordingly, officers satisfied that the revised plans as shown on screen to reduce the solid height and finish with trellis would alleviate the overbearing impact of the solid fencing but allow for light to go through the trellis. I think that's it. And at the same time, still give privacy to both number 21 and the neighbor. With regard to number 20, members will have noted on site also yesterday that the garden at number 20 is lower than that of the application site and accordingly does create the potential for overlooking onto the patio area to the rear of number 20's garage and their wider garden area. Therefore, as such, as you'll see in late corresponded, condition four has been updated that would see the trellis proposed continued around and along the boundary of number 20 up until the rear of the garage. It's considered that this would provide appropriate mitigation to the privacy issue. In conclusion, the application has been subject to considerable negotiation and evaluation from officers as well as the re relevant experts within the council's flood team. Subject to conditions set out in the officer's report and those updated in late correspondence, the application is presented to members today with a recommendation for approval. Thank you, Andrew. Mrs Trotman, would you like to address the planning committee, please? Thank you. You have four minutes, Mrs. Trotman. Thank you. In August 2017, I arrived at my property to find the applicant had built a breeze block wall along the full length of our mutual boundary. A new six foot six fence had been placed on top of the wall, which raised the boundary level to 2.7 metres high, thus breaching permitted development regulations. This has now been a blight on my property for two and a half years and severely impacted on my residential amenity. No prior consultation was sought, and trespass certainly had to take place for the build clearly constituted in a breach of the Party Wall Act under which this boundary is regulated by contract. The applicant has also breached the David Wilson restrictive covenants by not gaining written approval from the local authority prior to development. As time progressed, it became clear that the groundworks were causing significant harm to my land. The applicant had altered the natural flow of the land and left my garden waterlogged. The wall has caused a damning effect and subsequent pooling of water, which is severe. There is simply nowhere for the water to now drain away to. The applicant has also raised the level of earth they aside higher than the wall, resulting in an overspill of sod and earth into my garden. After many years of chasing the applicant via Monmouthshire Council and of chasing Monmouthshire Planning Department for progress, what I hope would be a final meeting on the 10th of October 2019, all parties attended, including Monmouthshire Planning Department, who agreed harm was being caused to my property. I had been asked to draw up a plan showing a system of drainage to attempt to resolve the problem by Monmouthshire Council. This was at my cost. Mr. James Woody had suggested in a previous on-site meeting a system of French drainage pipe to mitigate the harm being caused, and a plan was drawn up on his advice. This plan showed a system of drainage with both my garden at number 19 and number 21 had a perforated land drain with a non-woven membrane run the full length of both boundaries. This would then be linked into my storm drain on my property. This was clearly conveyed and agreed by all present. It was only on the understanding that this agreed plan would be carried out that access was given to my property. During these works, the applicant failed to install the drainage pipe on my side of the garden at number 19. 
I was not advised there had been any change of plan and certainly would not have agreed to it. This means that the pooling of water continues as it has nowhere to drain. Flooding also occurs onto the patio, so the works carried out have failed to mitigate the harm being caused to my property. I am still unsure as to who changed the plan, the applicant or Monmouthshire Council. Without a perforated pipe being installed on my side, there will be no improvement as the levels which have been constructed by the applicant are alien to the original development. Also, the density of the applicant's chippings, where the works have linked to my storm drain, has further exacerbated the problem. As you will have seen yesterday, the damage to my garden in that area is severe. I owned the property for over a year from now, before the applicant built the wall, during which time we had a severe winter and no flooding of this kind ever occurred. Thus, the ground raising has impacted on my residential amenity and continues to do so. I have now, on legal advice, withdrawn my goodwill gesture to allow the applicant to drain into my storm drain. Furthermore, no guarantees were given by the applicant with any of the work which took place. My concern is that the value of my property is being affected by the actions of the applicants who have not taken adequate steps to prevent damage to my property. With regard to the fence, it is also a detriment to my property. The current height stands at 2.7 metres. The applicant's revision C suggests the top 30 centimetres will now be replaced by trellis. This would still make the feather edge board 2.4 metres high, above regulated height. I am in a no-win situation. To reduce to regulated height would impact on my privacy, but to agree to the trellis in Revision C would mean a fence and trellis towering above us and my privacy being invaded. Furthermore, the new fence and wall have been attached to the existing fence, allowing no opportunity for maintenance, with the feather edge board resting toward the new fence. This remains the case and we've been unable to maintain it for two and a half years. Therefore, in the interest of fairness, after two and a half years of patience and compromise, I ask the planning permission is denied and the wall and fence be removed with the ground being put back to its original level. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr Johnson? No? Thank you, Chairman. I've, I've been involved in this application since it was originally submitted, uh, the request of Mrs. Mrs. Trotman. Um, the scope of that only included the fence, and I, th I think one of the issues was that that was wrong with there been engineering operations taking place where the um, ground levels have been increased above that permitted, uh, covered by permitted development rights. Um, I think it's a shame, and I think Mrs. Mrs. Trotman's reflected that had the applicant spoken to her, they might have been able to come to a resolution where both of them could have, have won. And I have no objection in principle with the land being raised for, for whatever purpose, if it was for the applicant's children. Um, I just think it could have been done a whole lot better without the need for a, for a, for a second fence and without the, any existing drainage problems being exacerbated. Um, it has dragged on for, for what, in excess of two years now. And I'd hoped and thought that the uh, resolution had been agreed between both parties until I'd heard again from Mrs. Trop and that the drainage scheme, as you see on the, the plan there and that had been discussed at the previous meeting, uh, was going to be implemented. However, for whatever reason, only half of it was implemented. And I understand the approach of, um, from James Woodier that he, he believes that what has been installed deals with the drainage matter and the surface water satisfactorily. Having said that, I'm not a technical expert, um, and there's whether it actually does do the job or not, there is perceived harm, which is a material concern. The courts have, sort of courts have held that before. Um, so I, I find great difficulty in being able to support this without that second drain being done. The other problem is, I, I explained to Mrs. Trotman, because the uh, land is outside the red line boundary, we can't condition that to be done as part of it. Whether or not you could, um, yeah where the drainage condition is as such that it requires the submission of a, a scheme for, for, for agreement with all parties, maybe that would deal with, with the red line issue. But as it stands, and I, I regret that it's a, it's a, a neighbour dispute and that in a, in a way neither are winners out of this, but I can't support the scheme until I can be convinced on, on Mrs. Trotman's behalf that the drainage issue is, 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 is dealt with. Thank you. Councillor Murphy. Thank you, Chair. And um, I wasn't there yesterday, but I have been to the site 
before we looked at it when it originally came in um, as part of the delegated panel. Um, I, it was quite obvious what the problems were uh, on that uh, site, and I'm pleased that um, a lot of work's gone on in the, the meantime to try and uh, mitigate it. Um, I was originally uh, concerned not only about the the uh, effect of the, of the work uh, uh, adjoining number number 19, which that um, drainage system there hopefully will resolve. Um, but I was also concerned that the uh, the soil was up against the back of the garage on the right hand side, if, as you look out of the house, and certainly some tanking arrangement there to prevent water going in is is definitely uh, definitely needed. Um, but um, as I understand it, our drainage engineer has had a look at the work that, that, that's been done and perhaps not done exactly to the plan, is satisfied that, that it, will, uh, it will in time mitigate the uh, circumstances. So, um, so I feel on, uh, on, on balance, and it is on balance, that um, we've, we've certainly done as much as we possibly can now to uh, remedy this, uh, this uh, situation. So, uh, again, I'm repeating myself, but on balance, I think uh, it's, uh, it's capable of being approved. Councillor Eason. Thank you, Chair. Um, the, uh, the garden was raised by 700 millimetres, which takes the party fence up to 2.7 metres, which is above the 2 metres permitted um, uh, regulated height. Um, by um, adding the pieces on top, you've got your 2.7 metres. Uh, had it not been raised, we'd, we'd be in a p position of um, lack of privacy for the, the, the objector. Um, by raising the garden at this height, uh, it's going to cause, with the breeze block wall, whichever may be behind, be behind there, is cause this flooding issue. The flooding issue, or the drainage issue, or the wet issue, is going to cause problems to the original party fence. It will rot in time. So that there's no, nothing to say who's going to be responsible for maintaining that fence, having had another fence put on the, on the inside of it. Um, I think that any extension of the, the party fence will be unsightly, and I do believe that the policy of permitted development should be protected by disallowing any raising of gardens to be, to be carried out where the raising will change the nature of the ecology of the neighbouring properties. I think it's a bad move, particularly in estates such as this where houses are closer together, where it's going to encroach upon uh, other, other neighbours' uh, immunities. So I can't support this. Thank you. Anybody else wish to comment? Councillor Brown? Yeah, um, I can't really comment about the technical aspect of the uh, drainage, but looking at from the site visit, it looks like the problem itself hasn't been satisfactorily solved for one reason or another and I think it does need um, looking at again. Thank you. Councillor Woodhouse. Thank you Chairman. That's exactly my thoughts. Uh, the, the comments made by the local member about the drainage being looked at again. I, I, would, I would endorse that. I think it does need to be further explored. Yeah, there's a point I, I, I forgot to ask, and we, we heard from Mrs. Trotman that she's withdrawn her, her good role dress gesture to have the surface water drained to her, the, the storm drain that's on her side of the fence. In, in, in the knowledge of that, how does that place us if committee were to approve that, knowing that the harm hadn't been mitigated? Yeah, thank you. No, that's a, a relevant question. Um, I think, I mean, it's a difficult one that the solution was outside of the boundary. Um, it, it could have been that the solution is removed today, six months. Um, I think from, from officer's point of view, the fundamental, the fundamental point was that the harm caused was only one, it was a, it was a possible mechanism for harm. It, 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 there, there's no definitive evidence that the uh, unfortunate condition of, of the garden or or the, the ground condition then of number 19 is entirely um, as a consequence of the groundworks undertaken at number 21. Um, so the, the mitigation that was offered was 
on that basis that it, it couldn't be definitively proved and, and they're still not aware of any definitive evidence. Um, I mean, clearly there's a car park that's a, at a raised level with runoff to the east. This was identified by our expert um, as what was done could have added and exacerbated an impact. There was no de denying of that. Um, but I think from officers, we have had to follow the advice given to us by the technical expert. Um, and that, that, whether it be now or say in six months time, that the right to remove that, that infrastructure, that equipment, providing the mitigation, um, could be done. It's, just, it's unfortunate that it's not within our gift or the planning conditions gift to find a solution within the red line boundary. Um, I say it's an on balance. I think weighing everything up, it was considered that even if in the event that that equipment apparatus was withdrawn from number 19, that on balance without any sort of definitive impact and evidence that it was all um, because of the groundworks at number 21, that we feel it's acceptable, even if that um, solution is uninstalled. It's unfortunate to say that the solution has only been installed for a couple of months. Um, it's been, you know, a, a wet winter. You know, it, it's unfortunate if it is to be removed now, that it hasn't had a chance to to prove itself and to take effect, um, because those sort of things do take time to have the desired solution that they're, they're then inputted for. So, um, hope that answers your question. Do you wish to make a suggestion, Councillor Howard? The problem is, Chair, I haven't really got one, and it, it, it answers the question in, in part, but then again, it, 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 it doesn't really, because there's still the issue of the, the mitigation of the, of, of, of the harm and the fact that it's in third-party <coughs> land. So in a sense, how can we consider that to be entirely germane if we couldn't apply a condition requiring the use of that same land um, to, to solve the problem. Um, regarding the the garage wall and the, and the fence of the other property and the suggestion that it could be tanked or whatever, could a scheme for drainage along the wall between Mr. Trotman's and the, and the applicants be part of that scheme as well? I mean, could, the, could the wall be tanked? This is, uh, We'd, uh, we'd need to seek you know, the, the prof professional expert opinion from the land drainage team. I mean, in that the solution that was delivered already was at his advice, and clearly that, I'm sure, if it could have been achieved within the site, then obviously that would have been the preference because it, it could have been wrapped up within a planning condition and its control. Um, I think touching on your points of, you know, in terms of not being able to support now that the mitigation, there's a possibility that it's withdrawn. Um, like I said, I think it goes back, you know, do we have sufficient evidence to say irrefutably that the harm caused definitively um, is such that we've convinced that it warrants refusal? Um, the officer's view is that it, that it doesn't and that what's been done is appropriate. Can I suggest, Councillor Howard, that you test the feeling of the meeting with moving a refusal? Yeah. Did, and then we can go forward from George Street, Roger. Yeah. Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, this is a real uh, problem, there's no doubt about it, but we've heard uh, from our experts uh, that we appointed that um, they think the scheme is, uh, is satisfactory. Um, so if we decide to... Um, go against that uh, advice, I'd like to know what useful reasons we're going to uh, come up with to uh, defend uh, an appeal. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Howard. As you suggested, Chair, I'll test the mood of the meeting and I, I, I move refusal on the basis of insufficient uh, information received to determine whether or not there's a harmful effect on neighbour amenity from surface water. Okay, is that seconded? Thank you, Councillor Higgins. Those who uh, will, will be against the application, please show. Oh God, it's everybody. But Roger. Okay, so it's lost. So. Go back to uh, 
basics, Jim. All right, Andrew. Thank you. Second application to deal with this afternoon is um, at Rosemary Beaufort Road, Osbaston. And uh, this is going to be taken through by Amy. Thank you, Amy. Thank you very much. Um, yes, this is application um, 00898, land to the rear of Rosemary, Beaufort Road, Osbaston. The application is for a new detached two-storey dwelling with integral garage, and driveway access from the highway with on-street parking and turn-in on site. The applications presented to planning committee due to there being five or more objections to the application. The application proposes a two-storey detached dwelling with adjoining single garage to the rear of Rosemary along Beaufort Road. The application proposes to share the existing access that serves the host property Rosemary and remove the existing single garage to create an access that serves the plot to the rear. The site is a long plot and a traditional dwelling located close to the front boundary with the highway but a large rear garden and shares a boundary on all sides with existing neighbouring properties. The uh, photographs you can see here is taken from uh, the bottom of the garden up towards the rear of the existing property, the host property, Rosemary. And the second one is taken towards looking at the rear boundary, the bottom of the garden. If we move on. Uh, the third photograph is along Beaufort Road, looking at the front of the existing host property and the white van you can see there on the view is where the access will be for the proposed new dwelling to the rear and the garage uh, is proposed to be demolished. The fourth photograph is the adjacent property of Downley and the next is the site plan with the garage identified in green. Least away, is it? Oh, sorry, it's the other side. Yes. Apologies. A number of consultations have been received in relation to the application. Monmouth Town Council have um, recommended refusal of the application based on overdevelopment of the site in terms of its location, scale, and the impact on neighbours in terms of residential amenity. Our ecologists have also been consulted as part of the application, and their response relates to concerns um, over horseshoe bats accessing the site using the rear garden in relation to the, the trees at the bottom of the garden as a connectivity to the local sack. Therefore, habitat risk rigs as regulations assessment was undertaken and a test of likely significance. The result is that the development has been revised to reduce the height of the building. The roof pitch and ridge heights have also been reduced. The first floor windows have been reduced in size, confirming on the plans that there will be no lighting on the southern elevation. Existing lighting has already been specified on the plan as low level, located away from the wooded corridor, shielded by porched areas. And they also recommend a condition in relation to mitigation. Welsh Water raised no objections in relation to the development. And then MCC Highways have also cons been consulted and responded. In relation to the access, the driveway is constructed to be permeable block paving is considered acceptable. The configuration of the proposed driveway, parking and turn-in arrangement will provide the required number of parking spaces in line with MCC's parking guidelines. This allows vehicles to turn within the development and exit onto the public highway in a forward gear. They consider this acceptable and raise no further objections. A number of objections have been received in relation to neighbours. I'll summarise these. These relate to overlooking onto neighbours' property and due to the proximity of the proposed dwelling to existing dwellings, that there is insufficient turning area within the site, further exacerbated by double garages, that the windows of, property of the front building face directly towards neighbours' property, again in relation to overlooking issues, that boundary materials will not screen views to neighbours' properties, 
that the principle of the development is unacceptable and inappropriate for this location, that the proposal will result in severe loss of privacy, that there is impact on ecological issues in relation to bats, and that the access is inadequate. There's concerns that there's too many infilling developments in the area, that the development detracts from the semi-rural feel, the disproportionate scale and mass of the proposed development of six bedrooms, that this results in a strain on community facilities, and that the existing house on the site has a potential for boost in rat, um, roost in bats, and that the existing mature tall hazel and laurel hedgerows on site provide a source for dormouse. Again, there's relation in concerns in relation to foul water, that a tree survey hasn't been done, and that the result is um, overdevelopment again. The plans were therefore revised in relation to the proposed dwelling. It was reduced in height and scale to a four-bed dwelling with a single-storey integral garage. In response to the revised plans, a further six representation, representations were received. Concerns then were that, this, that even though the proposal has been amended, it fails to address the northwest aspect and that it again is still inappropriate development and objections in principle. The infill does not respect or enhance its surroundings and it is not in line with the LDP policies. That the layout and design is essential to achieving, achieving quality of life and this is not achieved through proposed revised scheme. The officer has evaluated the proposals and makes the following comments. That the application site is within the development boundary. The principle of development, of residential development in the back of the plot is acceptable in principle and follows the LDP policies. In addition, a recently adopted supplementary planning guidance on infill residential development has overarching objectives which set out to make efficient use of brownfield land perfect residential amenity, both of new and existing occupiers, make a positive contribution to the recreation of distinctive communities, places and spaces, respond to the context and character of the area and should be of a good design which is sustainable. Further guidance is provided in the SPG, which was adopted in 2019, which gives guidance in relation to distances between proposed infill properties and existing dwellings to ensure that residential immunity is protected. In relation to the design of the proposals, that whilst, the tradi whilst traditionally this proposal may appear as backland development, the existing layout with the host dwelling is located to the side and the front, enables an aspect for the new dwelling towards the highway. The urban grain is therefore not altered significantly. The proposed dwelling with its reduced scale now sits comfortably on the plot and within the footprint of the surrounding dwellings. There are a mix of house designs in the area and this traditional simple design works with the setting where there is no overarching form or design to follow. The proposed external materials are acceptable. When framed with the improved indigenous landscaping of new native hedgerows along the boundaries, it has helped that the development will settle into its context. In relation to the concerns in terms of amenity and the, and the adjacent residential properties, this has been minimised with the siting of the dwelling combined with the existing mature foliage that runs along the boundary of the site, in particular to the rear of the site and the hedgerow, the uh, tree row that you can see in the photograph. There are no first floor side windows serving habitable windows that may overlook neighbouring properties. The proposed dwelling has been sited almost adjacent to number 11, Charles Close, with a 4.3 metres separating the proposed development from the common boundary of this property. This minimises the impact of the proposal on the property in terms of massing and over-dominating impact. The separating distance to the rear, to the west, is considered acceptable and coupled with the strong landscape tree belt, which is to be retained, results in this development not having an adverse effect or overbearing impact on the neighbouring property. As I say, the proposal meets the privacy guidance that are identified in the supplementary planning guidance and have been designed of a scale where the roof lines run adjacent to the neighbouring properties and sit below that of the neighbouring properties, namely number 11, Charles Street and Lisa Wen. In terms of access, 
the highways team have raised no objections and that is considered acceptable. The, it is proposed after meeting on site that a construction um, management plan is put in place as a condition to ensure that construction traffic is appropriate for the area, the timings are considered and that, for example, a concrete lorry will have wheel washing and ensure that the road is not um, dirtied with traffic, uh, with mud from, um, from site. It is considered that the lands, the visual impact is acceptable, that the height and mass of the proposal is such that it will be viewed in continuation with the built form of the existing pattern of development in relation to Charles Close. In relation to drainage, again, this was raised on site yesterday. The application will be subject to SAB approval and will require full compliance with sustainable drainage or SUDS. This deals with all surface water and should be managed on site. In conclusion, the application is more than adequate to accommodate the proposed dwelling and is able to provide the required on-site parking and turning and associated landscaping. The proposed dwelling is of a traditional two-storey design and has been designed and sited to ensure that it does not adversely impact on neighbour amenity. It also works with the context of the surrounding area. The proposal provides ecological net gain and delivers a scheme that meets planning policy and the relevant supplementary planning guidance. The recommendation is therefore to approve. Thank you, Amy. Um, Mr John Craig, please. Yeah, okay. All right. Richard Rodman, please. Council. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm speaking both as a councillor for the Dixton with Osbaston Ward and as a member of Monmouth Town Council Planning Committee. Firstly, I would like to briefly share the views of Monmouth. Uh, Town Council's Planning Committee and its Chair regarding the processing of this application. Monmouth Town Council Planning Committee met last night to discuss the application and noted that the week before our meeting to discuss it, MCC Planning had made a recommendation to approve the proposed development. It appears that MCC Planning does not consider our views are of consequence and our perspective is that they would fail to be consolidated into the officer's report. Secondly, the chair and members of Monmouth Town Council Planning Committee feel that we are there to represent our residents. The question has been asked if there is any point of having a Monmouth Town Council Planning Committee if our views are not provided in good town time sorry, for members of the MCC Planning Committee to consider. It also feels as if the process has been very rushed we normally have 21 days in which to respond, and in this case, only 14 days. If I understand correctly, you are unable to approve the application today, only to recommend approval due to the consultation end date being Friday the 7th of Feb. Unfortunately, as the planning portal has been down for a considerable time, I am unable to verify this. Perhaps this can be clarified for members of the committee before they consider the evidence. Because of the rush to, gut, uh, to gather information from residents, I did request a deferment of the application, but as you can see, we are here today, so failed. The Monmouth Town Council uh, councillors feel that the process has undermined local democracy and current thoughts are that the committee may disband. I have to ask the question of a councillor that I'm proud to represent as a county councillor, have we, we, have we been fair with the residents of Dixton with Osbaston with this process? Moving on to the application itself, I would like to share some reasons that suggest you should consider voting against this development. A Welsh Assembly inspector turned down an appeal against a similar style of development on a larger plot about 50 metres away. This was approximately 15 years ago. He gave his reasons as amenities of this area should not be damaged by over-intensive development referring to the general housing policy, which also presumes against overdevelopment and insensitive or inappropriate infilling. 
This form of building is known as tandem development, and it is well established that such a form of vehicular, vehicular access, that's passing between the two adjacent dwellings, can cause a loss of privacy and amenity to the dwelling it passes by, virtue of noise, fumes, and general disturbance. This would certainly be the case here. I've noted on my site inspection that tandem development is not a feature of the sounding area, and as such, it introduces, its introduction here would constitute inappropriate infilling, contrary to the policies of the adopted local plan. I've considered all the points advanced in favor of the proposal, but they do not change my clear view that the scheme would represent overdevelopment of the original curtilage of the property, harmful to the character of the area and to the amenity and privacy of residents. For the reasons given above, the appeal site is simply not large enough to constitute a potential building plot, nor does it have adequate vehicular access. For these reasons, the appeal must fail. So that application was turned down. That was St. Osyth. Clearly, the Welsh Assembly Planning Inspector did not approve of the development, one well, that is a close approximation to the one that we are considering today. As far as I am aware, nothing in the LDP has changed this position. Beaufort Road has had little development in the intervening years. And if I recall correctly, only one house, a few extensions, and a garage or two being built, thus retaining its original character. Thinking in terms of broader issues, the piecemeal development taking place adds up over time to a radical and harmful change to the character of Dixton with Osbaston. To reach Beaufort Road, you have a choice of three routes, via Duchess Road, Prospect Road, or Highfield Road. All of these have sizable lengths of single track road, all impassable to two cars passing. So people are having to reverse, use people's drives, etc. And this does cause many issues, particularly for people who have some difficulty looking over the shoulder to reverse. Walkers, cyclists, and mobility scooter users. Adding a single house will not do much to Osbaston, but in recent years, we have seen approvals for two houses at Kay Elga on Highfield Road, a single house in Duchess Road, a single house in Beaufort Road, and the building of a large extension for family members in a house on Prospect Road. And undoubtedly, there will be more, and some that I have probably missed. Travel by car is becoming increasingly a problem, but is a necessary one. The proposed development is too far to walk to senior schools. There are no shops or surgeries in the area, which results in a necessarily high uh, dependence on cars. Pavements are largely absent, so prevent walking to Osbaston Church. Councillor, if you could wind up now, please. Your time has lapsed. Oh, thank you. Um, right. I'll just uh, summarise then. Uh, in summary, the proposed development does not make a positive contribution to the creation of distinctive communities. It will have the opposite effect. It runs a very real risk of diluting the context and character of the area. It damages wildlife. It increases the risk of flooding. It adds to road danger for all the pedestrians, cyclists, and walkers. And I strongly recommend that you turn down this application. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much. Mr. Craig, if you'd like to come up to the podium, please. <coughs> you have four minutes, Mr. Craig. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is John Craig. I've lived in Beaufort Road for 30 years. Uh, firstly, all the residents that objected to this are extremely surprised that this proposal has reached the stage given its very unsuitable nature. This is not nimbyism in a usual sense. It's about the holy and inappropriateness of the proposal. The following represents the views of local residents. On a personal basis, I purchased our house in 1989 for three main reasons. Osbaston had a village field, the reputation of the local schools, but importantly, a large garden for a young family. The garden, as far as we're concerned, is an amenity for us, adjoining, neighbor, uh, adjoining neighbors and wildlife. This proposal has received more than 60 objections, probably more than that because the portal has been down, and that underlines the level of concern. 
No one likes the disturb disturbance that building work brings, whether simple extension or indeed the proposal now submitted. However, a suitable scheme is usually accepted generally with good grace. Committee members visited the site yesterday and our opinion as resident remains. It is not a desirable and appropriate application. It does not conform to the local development plan. The local town council planning committee have twice voted to decline the proposal, both times unanimously by five to nil. The application does not meet with central government's planning, which is to avoid garden grabbing, reducing amenity, harming the eco ecological system and placing a further unwelcome burden on local infrastructure. It does not, meet, is, does not meet desirable street scene consideration being a tandem development. In the last 12 months, two other very local ap applications were submitted and declined for the same reason. Uh, the width uh, of Rosemary has the narrowest potential in the road compared to other properties, underlining the pinched access. In comparison to this poorly thought out design, there are two examples of more acceptable use of garden developments which have been approved at Westfield Road and Duchess Road. They are side by side properties, not behind one another. The, width, the width of gardens of those properties are measurably larger than Rosemary. This application does not improve the character and amenity of Osbaston. It is not a building necessity. There is a substantial number development of new houses in Monmouth, in Wanastow Road, for example, with David Wilson and Taylor Wimpy. The decision should be made mindful of two important words, principle and precedent. The principle is covered in detail in this presentation and by Councillor Rodden. The precedent is a very dangerous one to set if approved. I personally know of two applications at least that will come forward immediately if approval is granted. Historically poor planning in Osbaston has resulted uh, in lack of safe, safe, safe play areas, uh, the, the danger of Osbaston losing, losing, its, losing its uniqueness and it's already becoming a high density area. We expect due diligence from councillors at county level to protect the area. The Welsh Government has indicated that climate change is a top priority. Recent extremes, extremes of weather will continue and the persistent heavy rain that we now encounter shows that existing infrastructure cannot cope. Regular flooding occurs in the gardens of existing properties adjacent to the plot with sandbags needed on occasions to stem matters. Access, the, front of, the frontage is very narrow. No mention is made of the recommendation as to the feasibility of construction vehicles in the proposition. There are no adequate payments for all pedestrians, including children and elderly residents. No safe route to school, as Councillor Roden has alluded to. The access to the property is a very narrow single track lane. There must be the distinct possibility of some cars on occasion having to reverse blind into Beaufort Road, despite the turning areas. Highways have commented that one more dwelling will not advance, advance, adversely affect traffic flows. They have taken no account of local conditions. Two large properties currently under construction in Westville Road will use Beaufort Road given their position in Westville Road because the latter, pro latter road is in unadopted and unmade and likened to an off-road track. Location. There are no local shops or surges or any play area apart from a very small one at the school. There's li very little parking for delivery vans. Visitors will undoubtedly need to park on Beaufort Road, resulting in traffic blocking, which already happens and experienced yesterday morning by the councillors. Parking overspill already occurs with vehicles using pavements as Beaufort Road does not allow two-way flow. The result already is that cars using private drives, cars have to use private dri driveways to navigate. If, if you could wind up now, please. Pardon? If you could wind up, sir, your four minutes is a lap. Right. Uh, basically, it goes against the Welsh Government's spatial, de spatial de plan, which is uh, about achie achieving uh, uh, value in the environment. It also uh, does, does not respect the distinctiveness of the community. The community strategy as well, people are supposed to enjoy um, their lifestyles without reduced, with, with reduced reliance on private cars. It doesn't, it doesn't, the proposal doesn't protect residential property, it worsens it. And as Councillor Roden uh, alluded to, there's, there's already, and I have, a, I have the letter on my desk, the letter going back to 2004 by the Welsh Inspector, which formally objects to any form of tandem bin filling. The process, the final thing I would say, the process or of the access road will result in the fact that there will be only nine feet, not metres, but nine feet from a bedroom in the adjoining property, which presents significant I'm, health I must issues. stop you now, sir, because okay. you had an extra minute. Okay. But thank you very much indeed. I call Mr. Buckle, please. You state your name, please. You have four minutes, Mr. Buckle. Thank you. 
Thank you, Chair and members of the Planning Committee for the opportunity of speaking today. My name is Glyn Buckle of Buckle Chamberlain Partnership, and we submitted the application for the proposed new dwelling uh, to the rear of Rosemary Cottage following a positive response to the pre-application advice in December 18. The site covers an area of 700 square metres, which is more than adequate to support one dwelling. The new property has been designed to fit in to the existing site and sits comfortably on the plot. The design takes into account neighbours' comments and also deals with comments raised in respect of ecology and biodiversity. The existing surface water course along the southeastern boundary of the site is to remain undisturbed, ensuring that the existing wildlife ha habitat is maintained. The existing hedgerow and trees will form an effective screen for the existing properties to, in Duchess Road to the southeast. Access to the site is from Beaufort Road, as has been discussed, and it is, it is proposed to demolish the existing garage and provide a new permeable driveway which will provide parking for a minimum of three vehicles, serving the new, new dwelling, and establish a turning area which enables vehicles to enter and leave the site in the forward direction. The new drive will also provide access for the host property, Rosemary, and again will provide turning areas within the site. Every reasonable objection which has been put forward by neighbours has been dealt with by careful redesign and pro providing expert ecological and landscape reports. Surface water drainage from the site will comply with Welsh Office legislation and will be subject to sustainable drainage proposals and will include rainwater harvesting. The application site is within the development boundary of Monmouth and is within an area which has been developed extensively over the last 50 years. When my clients purchased the property, it stood alone in open fields. Charles Close and other neighbouring properties were non-existent at that time. The proposed dwelling sits comfortably on the plot and in its relation to the existing dwellings in Charles Close. There are numerous mixed designs in the area and the one that has been designed works well within its setting. The proposal uses traditional materials such as slate roofs and cell coloured rendered walls and, and linked with a substantial landscape proposal can only assist the development nestle into the surrounding area. As, say, as stated previously, the property has been amended following concerns by neighbours and the potential impact minimised. There are no first floor habitable windows facing neighbouring properties. And the proposed dwelling is almost in line with the adjacent property, 11 Charles Close. The overall height of the building has been reduced and is lower than the ridge of Charles Close. And also as the double garage has been replaced with a single garage. The existing tree belt and existing land landscaping to the southeast is to be, to be retained and therefore there'll be no adverse overlooking issues to the neighbouring properties. My client has appointed specialist ecologists to ensure that the proposals meet requirements of biodiversity. And the proposal provides ecological enhancement by the inclusion of native species hedgerows. My client has provided all the necessary information required by the local authority, including boundary ownership, which has become quite contentious, to confirm that the application site is able to accommodate the proposed dwelling and provides the required parking and turn areas. The proposal makes good use of brownfield land and adds a new, much needed sustainable property in the housing stock of Monmouthshire. The proposal fully complies with recently adopted SPG on infill development and is of good design and is totally sustainable. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much indeed. Craig. Uh, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to pick up on a, a few queries that um, Councillor Roden brought up in relation to the procedure and how we've communicated the proposed development with Monmouth Town Council and local residents. So the application was submitted last June 
um, and we've done a 21-day consultation period during that process. And Monmouth Town Council come back to us on the 12th of August, outlining their concerns, which outlined in the report, in terms of the development being overdevelopment, um, outlining the location, the scale, and the impact on the neighbouring properties. Um, as a result of these comments, the scheme has been amended significantly um, and has been reduced in scale and size. Um, I did speak to Councillor Rodent uh, last week, um, and as a master, of course, it's down to the local planning authority to determine whether a reconsultation exercise is conducted. Now, in terms of us being open and transparent, we then sent um, the amended plans to the neighbouring residents and to the town council for comment, and that consultation period ended on Friday. Um, so we did give those 14 days to look at the comments. But Monmouth Town Council certainly are not prejudiced by um, the application being considered today. Uh, obviously, you've heard their concerns and their objections and to the principle of development, but given the scale of development is, be, is being reduced, we feel that it was, it was appropriate to have the, the consideration here today. Um, so I just want to clear that up in terms of the, the amount of time the application has been in the, in the, in the process for, um, and it has gone through a full consultation process. Um, admittedly, I think there's some lessons learned with regards to the deadline being last Friday um, and, and the meeting being here today, and that's something that I think we need to take away. But in terms of the consideration of, uh, on the merits of the planning application, I, I, I fully think that it can be considered today and, and um, be considered by planning committee members. Right, we had a visit there yesterday. Members, anybody commented? Am I allowed another two minutes? Uh, you are at the end. Okay. Okay. Mm, very quiet. <laughs> Councillor Brown? Yeah, um, I just wondered, obviously the application is said um, it aligns with the street at the back, but it doesn't actually access the, what was it, Charles? Was it Charles? Charles Street, it doesn't actually come to the, it doesn't actually access that because obviously it's in tandem to it. And I just wondered, it says that it's compliant with the supplementary um, planning policy on infill development, which was um, dated November 2019. Um, but I just wondered, I haven't seen anything in the report that talks about the access gradient because within that policy it says, uh, the access gradient should be no steeper than 1 in 10, subject to a maximum gradient of 1 in 8. Now, I noticed when we were on the site visit, there was quite a slope down, and there doesn't seem to be any comment on the gradient. And uh, I'd just like that point clarified, because obviously uh, the applicant's representative has says that it complies with that policy, and I'm not quite sure whether it does or it doesn't because of the gradient point. Thank you. Amy, can you answer that? Uh, yeah, the... Oh, can you hear me? The supplementary planning guidance said that it should ideally be no steeper than one in ten, subject to a maximum gradient of um, one to eight. So it's an ideal. These are guidelines. Um, but it's a good point that you raise, actually, as we've discussed with the um, agent that is proposed to add an additional condition on the consent for um, full site sections, cross section and long section to ensure that the gradients are sufficient, they're appropriate, and that can be managed through that condition. Councillor Peakins. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Chair. Um, 60 complaints is a large number of complaints for us to receive on an application. Um, just looking at, uh, I, I wasn't on the site visit yesterday, unfortunately, I didn't manage to get there. Um, but looking at the site on Google Earth, I know the area got went anyway, but looking at the site on Google Earth, um, this could be opening the floodgates for a large scale of development, because uh, effectively all the houses on, on Duchess Road are back onto this area of land with, those, with, the, with the taller trees, um, and some others with Beaufort Road as well, um, could all use this application as a, uh, um, as justification for, for further applications in that same uh, in, that, in that same area, um, a, lo a lot of this is to do with local amenity. It is to do with the look and the feel of the place. T to me personally, and I know these designs are subjective, but to me personally, that, that the design that we've been presented with at the moment does look like it's uh, um, out of a you know a, a modern development. Um, it doesn't necessarily sit so well, in my view, my own view subjective though it may be, so well with the other houses in the area. Um, so, so, so for me personally, I, I'm, I'm not convinced that what we've been presented with is the best design for
for that location. Probably doesn't take into account the, the number of objections that we've received from local residents. Um, and for me personally, I think it does affect the local community and it does affect the local, um, uh, the, 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 the local look and feel of the residents who overlook that area of land and then also to boot the fact that it could open the floodgates into a, a raft of developments, which I feel, me personally, I think we would struggle to defend. Um, but there's a lot of reasoning that going on there. But on the point that Louise has just raised, on that single point alone, I don't feel comfortable that we can make a decision in this committee today. Uh, and I would prefer to, or I, I would propose that we defer this application today until we have the evidence, until we have the further information come back that Louise has indicated on. Thank you, Councillor Harris. Thank you, uh, Chair. Now, I, for one, over the years, uh, have always um, been complaining that we never knew when we saw a plot with a proposed building to go on onto it, whether or not it was too big, too small, etc. So we finally fought and got our supplementary planning guidance, which uh, uh, we got late last year from what i know from that guidance from what i know from this report um, we uh, have compliance all the way down the um, uh, the line here i can't see anything in the report that moves uh, approval that uh, uh, contradicts that and um I see absolutely no reason why we haven't, shouldn't have the uh, uh, the guts, if you like, to uh, uh, determine this today. I don't think we need to refer, defer, and uh, I, for one, am happy to move approval. Thank you, uh, Councillor Becker. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> yeah, I'd have to probably disagree with pretty much everything Matt said there. Really, if uh, strength of feeling and number of objections were a the thing, then. Plenty of things wouldn't have gone through on this committee because we we have a certain number of objections over five. We take the take it to committee. It's not about the amount of objections we get. Equally, precedent is not important to us. We can neither make our decisions on previous precedent or worry about future precedent. We make our decisions based on the application in front of us. And we fought for that supplementary guidance, as Councillor Harris has said, we abide by that supplementary guidance. I think that, you know, had the back of that garden been for sale when Charles Close was built, there would be another house on the end of Charles Close. You know, it is in keeping with the scowl of the surrounding area. So I understand the strength of feeling, but we have to, to work to our rule. There's no reason for us, I, I can find, to hang on to this. As much as I hate, you know, back garden grabs, you know, there's nothing I could hang on to this that wouldn't get overturned in appeal. So. Thank you. Councillor Webb. The foul sewage has been, um, has been dealt with, but I'm just a bit more concerned about the surface water drainage. Um, I heard that there was going to be, um, the water is going to be reused, but are there any details of how the surface water will be dealt with, please, particularly um, looking at the lie of the land? Thank you. Yeah, the officer's report adds that to achieve compliance with sustainable drainage legislation, the new dwelling will have rainwater harvesting system to collect and store rainwater and make use of it to flush toilets, supply washing machines, etc. There will be little, if any, water discharging into the ground to soak away. In fact, the rainwater harvesting installation will require mains water supply as stored water, as if it's not sufficient on its own. The driveway will be per permeable surfacing to avoid runoff, so all surface water will be managed on site. Councillor Louise Brown. Yeah, um, I think um, <coughs> Councillor Becker has uh, said how we've fought um, for this particular guidance. And it's not just uh, 8.5 that says the gradient of vehicular access drive should ideally be no steeper than 1 to 10, 10%, subject to maximum gradient of 1.8. It also provides a table below of minimum access width widths and it says two to five houses, 4.1 metres. Now, again, there's nothing in the report um, 
to actually say that that has been those measurements are, are missing and uh, you know, we, we've said we've got this guidance that we want to comply with. It doesn't say ideally on on that, I don't believe. Um, and uh, it's just really um, all. Uh, I'm not suggesting that um, the, the development itself may or may not be acceptable. Just that um, if we've gone to the lengths of providing guidance, and we've and our officers have actually put forward specific measurements you know how can we say we're complying with those if we don't have any report to say that's the case i'm not saying that it has to be um a long deferment but i do think that um if we've if we've bothered to do this and obviously officer time has been spent in doing this then we we really ought to when there's actual figures there um try and at least check it out thank you Thank you. Can I clarify that? Um, right. oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> the, um, the proposal is for one house, so table four identifies the minimum access as 2.75, and the plans identify that as 3.5. So it's the uh, minimum, the access is over the minimum required for but one it, individual it, plot. It's really the access for both. It's a shared drive. It's for one additional dwelling. Yes, yeah, shared drive, so it's two houses. Hold on. Uh, sorry. Yeah, just a couple of points there, really. Um, a lot of discussion around the principle of development um, and whether this sort of tandem development is acceptable. Obviously, this site lies within Monmouth's development boundary where the principle of residential development is already established. We're looking at the material planning considerations as to whether the siting of this dwelling in this location is having unacceptable harm on the residents and the character and appearance of the area. As outlined in the report, um, the, the appearance and the visual immunity and the impact it's having on the area is considered to be acceptable. Um, as you can see from the location plan, the siting of the properties, you can see the alignment of the properties, and I think it's for members to consider whether the siting of that property is out of character with other dwellings in the area. Um, that's a judgment for, for you to make as, as members, but obviously as officers, we feel that there is enough space around that property. Um, it's in accordance and looks in context with other dwellings in that area. In terms of the supplementary planning guidance, that has been developed by the request of planning committee members for your guidance, for your help and support in determining planning application. It is guidance, however, um, and you need to take each case on their merits. Um, we have reviewed this development in association with that guidance. We are satisfied that the privacy distances are acceptable. The gradient and access has been fully considered by highways officers. They've looked at that. They, are, uh, they consider it to be acceptable. The finished floor levels are outlined on the submitted plans. Um, and we, are, we, are, we do consider this proposed development to be acceptable in all those regards. Amy has outlined that we would, um, that the applicant could submit a section through the site to show the exact levels and if there's going to be any retaining walls. And I think that would be a good idea. Um, however, all of this information has been considered by highways officers and by planning officers, and we do feel it is acceptable. Just want to clarify a few of those points. Also, um, within the, with this development, something that wasn't picked up before was that we would receive affordable housing contribution of eight thousand pounds for this development as well. Thank you, Craig. Um, Councillor Howard, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, first issue, well, it's not, not an issue, it's a, it's, it's a point. I'm surprised that there wasn't a request from highways to see if there could be some betterment to extend the footway in front of Downley across the, the, the curtilage of this house. Appreciate there isn't, it doesn't continue then at Police Wen, but you know, it's at least it's a step in the right direction. And if there is further development where that could be um, extended further for safety of pedestrians, um, particularly if there's going to be an intensification of use of that road, then that would have been helpful to have. I'm also referring to the SPG, and I should say I have no problems with the design of the house at all. I think it's absolutely fine. The prevailing character of the area in terms of the design of the properties is varied, and I think that's what makes it it's so attractive. The plot is also clearly um, big enough. Um, the, where there's a, a little bit of an issue for me then is that um, paragraph 5.2 of the SPG, where it suggests that uh, proposals should um, reflect the, the density of residential area. Um, 
and the garden space should re reflect the size and function of the dwelling and prevailing character of the area. Now, if you take Charles Close as a cut of everything then to the southwest, um, they're massive gardens, basically, and I'm, I'm sure if that land came forward to development, it would be uh, very much denser than, than it is now. Um, but that, I, I'm not sure that has been addressed. Then also, paragraph 7.12 and sketch 9 in the SPG refer to the 45-degree rule, um, looking at Felice Swen then and the, the, the limit of the elevations to the southeast. Um, that's a bungalow, isn't it? So you've got the you have a, a two-story house then to the east. Have we looked at whether or not there are any windows to habitable rooms in the back of that bungalow, Felice Swen, and whether or not they then conflict with the 45-degree rule or even the 25-degree, um, given that we've got two-story and one-story? Amy, do you want to answer that question? Uh, there are windows at the back of the property at least when, but the ex the front elevation of the proposed dwelling is 5.8 meters um, as a, as a dis as a, a <coughs> as an angle from the rear corner of least when to the front corner of the garage diagonally. So the whole aspect of the front of the proposed property looks forward to Beaufort Road, and least when looks rear. To, to the boundary, there isn't considered to be any overlooking issues with windows in that respect. Let's uh, quite clarify that then. So yeah. at what distance would we consider that um, the conflict with a 45 degree rule taken from the midpoint of the window in the back of Fleece when would be an infringement of amenity? In relation to the plot, we'd have to. So, so there is a significant amount of landscape in, in, in between the um, bungalow and the existing property, and also the, the distance there. Which uh, can you re measure that up, please, Amy? While we're looking at this, the screen is considered to be acceptable. Is considered to be acceptable in terms of the forty-five degree angle. Just to quickly add in relation to that point, though, there is a large buffer that travels from the front of Beaufort Road to the back of the property and shares the boundary between Lisa Wen and the proposed dwelling and Rosemary, and that is an existing boundary. It is proposed to replace this in a native hedge and retain the um, fence in the existing position. So there is quite a significant amount of screening between the existing property and the proposed dwelling. While we wait for Phil to come back with the scale rule, shall we carry on? Yep. All right. Phil, Councillor Murphy. <coughs> yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I acknowledge the fact that there's been a lot of uh, objections to this um, this application, but there's also been an awful lot of, um, of attention given to those uh, objections, and there's uh, a considerably different uh, scheme in front of us now uh, to that that was originally envisaged. Um, I take Councillor Becker's point too that um, that had that piece of land been available uh, to the market, uh, Charles Close would have been uh, would have been continued further in that uh, direction because the, the property does sit um, very very conveniently within the uh, lie of the properties that are uh, that are uh, on that site. Uh, I wasn't there yesterday, unfortunately. Uh, as you know, I was in London. But, um, but ha having regard to the report itself, which I've read extensively, uh, I can't see uh, any reason left to ob object to it. So um, I'm happy to second uh, Councillor Harris's uh, uh, proposal to uh, approve it. Okay, thank you. Tony in there. Yeah, I've got him down. Do you want to answer the question now for a distance? Yeah. So apologies for that. I didn't have a scale rule here. So to clarify, from the rear of Fleeswen to the corner of the proposed dwelling at the 45 degree angle, it is 16 meters. But also to reference that the proposed dwelling sits at a lower level to the existing as well. So bearing in mind that element, 
and the 60 meters meets the garage, which is a single story element on the side of the proposed dwelling. So bearing all that in mind, the lower <coughs> ridge height, the lower single story element, the screening and 60 meters is considered to be acceptable and there isn't an adverse impact on residential amenity. Thank you, Councillor Webb. Chairman, um, Amy, have you got details of the construction management plan? If you could just give us details of the working hours and the days when they're, when we're, when they're not allowed to work, please. Thank you. That's proposed to be added as a condition, so a pre-commencement condition. So before any development happens on, high, on site, it is proposed that that scheme, those details will be submitted and approved by um, officers. Councillor Tony Eason, please. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, my only question is about um, condition number six to do with the, tre the trees. Looking at the, the Google Maps, there's a lot of green foliage there. Um, how, how strong is condition six in maintaining as much green greenery as possible? Um, the whole of the area has got a lot, lot of trees, but I noticed that when Charles Close was built and parts of the Beaufort Road, I presume, was sold off, there haven't been many trees re retained. There's a big block of trees then further on down. Um, it's, it's retention of the uh, foliage I'm concerned about. So the condition says that none of the existing trees enclosed by the protective fence shall be felled, lopped or topped. So those are protected by that condition. If any of these trees are removed or die or severely damaged, they shall be replaced by additional species. So there's an element of uh, that's that, that condition does protect those trees. It's also suggested there that there are two further landscaping conditions to clarify the full extent of landscaping on the site, hard and soft landscaping, and then a condition that ensures the implementation of that scheme of landscaping, just to ensure that the screening that is on site and that is proposed is actually implemented and secured. Thank you, David. Uh, Councillor David Dubby. Speak loudly, David. Uh, so the if you look at the um sorry chair can I come in there if you look at the um hatched out square there that's where the levels change so it's fifty two point seven six on the road and then it's fifty two point seven three roughly at that location so it's more or less level there so you'd be able to stand um the, the, uh, the cow would be able to sit there level and look down in both directions in terms of visibility. Yeah. So, well, obviously, in, in this sort of residential area on a shared access, I, I don't think a speed would be excessive in terms of travelling. But there is a level access there for somebody to stop and be able to look in both directions. And obviously, as I've reiterated, the highways have looked at this access point. It's an existing access point. It's going to be used, and I think they have no objections to those concerns. And we can also add that condition if members feel in terms of sections and levels. But we do have the levels uh, to look at. Amy's just said 10 metres. Alan, quickly. Just very quickly, Chair. I wasn't there for the site visit, unfortunately. So I've listened very carefully to the debate. 
I, I come here and I look at the, in relation to planning, not to other things, about cars and other stuff like that. And as far as I can see, I can see no objection to this application whatsoever. And therefore, I'd like to second Councillor Harris's proposal. Sorry. Right, we have a mover of the um, this application, Councillor Harris, seconded by Councillor Murphy. All those in favour, please show. Are you voting? And the, yeah, do you want to? Hold on, sorry, it's my mistake. <laughs> Councillor Roden, sorry. You only get two minutes this time. Two minutes, uh, yeah. two minutes this time, uh, Richard. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to refute that objections have been sufficiently mitigated. In my opinion, they haven't. Uh, this development is out of keeping and harms visual amenity. The proposed development will be visible from many houses in this part of Osbaston, as it is at the bottom of the valley. It would adversely impact the quality of the environment and visual amenity for many walkers, particularly those that walk down Beaufort Road, as they will see the building by the roof line of the bungalows, giving a very cramped appearance to the site, reminiscent of parts of Dixton Close. Secondly, the access from the proposed development is directly onto a narrow lane, completely blinded on the left-hand side. It might be 10 metres of flat ground, but you have to put a car bonnet out about a metre and a half before you can actually enter the road. So it is dangerous. And uh, uh, drainage is uh, quite an issue in the area. I'm a bit concerned about the idea of various levelings. Will that actually adversely impact on drainage? The impact on properties next door could be uh, significant. And uh, finally, parking. Uh, as yet you experienced yesterday, uh, there were a number of vehicles there. If there was a children's party in the area, all the cars that you saw on the road would be parking on the pavements rather than on the road so that cars could go past. But it would be... Uh, a significant issue causing a danger to pedestrians and I again recommend refusal. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. <coughs> right, going backwards slightly, we've had it proposed for uh, acceptance by Councillor Harris and seconded by Councillor Murphy. Can all those in favour of this application please show? And those against, please show. Yeah. And I'm an I'm an abstainer. Abstentions. Yeah, three. Well, the application has been approved. Right. We now go on to uh, the third application this afternoon, which is for uh, seven dwellings at Woodbine Field, Monmouth Road, Usk. Yep, yep, thank you, Chair. So, yeah, this is a full application for the erection of seven dwellings uh, that will be served by four new shared access points. The site is located along Monmouth Road on the edge of the town of Usk. Uh, and the application is presented to you today, members, uh, as there have been objections from five or more separate households. So again, for the benefit of any members that weren't on site yesterday, just quickly run through some site photographs. Uh, this is the view of the site frontage uh, heading along Monmouth Road towards Gwahalog. And then the next image, that's again the site, site frontage looking back towards us. You can see the gable end then with the adjoining property. Uh, and that is just a, a sort of slightly further back view showing the context of the neighbouring dwelling, Danakoiv. Um, so, as stated, the site is located on the edge of the town, uh, immediately to the southeast of Burium Gate development, um, as is shown on the plan on screen. Um, so, as you can see on the proposed layout drawing, um, the 
development would take a linear form uh, along Monmouth Road with four shared accesses as illustrated. Phil, can you shift him on? There we go. So the two semi uh, there would be a semi detached dwellings uh, on the western end of the site would be affordable housing, and these would be secured through a section 106 agreement, with the rest uh, comprising detached open market housing. Uh, with regard to the external finishes, the dwellings would include both a combination of both stone and render to the walls, artificial roof slate and grey PVC doors, windows. And in respect of boundary treatment, uh, this would see the existing hedgerow retained along the front boundary to Monmouth Road, uh, 1.8 high close board fence between rear gardens and post and rail fencing to the rear of the site. So just in terms of some of the house types in a little more detail, um, you should be able to see on screen now, this is the pair of semi-detached uh, affordable units. And then the next slide just shows an example of one of the detached open market houses. Um, perhaps the 3D images will show a better illustration. So that's the site frontage. Um, and then to the rear, you can see then the rear and again the context of the neighboring property. So I'll just leave it on those slides. <laughs> so with regard to detail considerations, in terms of principle, the settlement of ASK is identified in Strategic Policy S1 as a rural secondary settlement. Policy SAH10 asserts that such settlements are relatively sustainable and offer the range of community facilities uh, that are considered suitable for small-scale residential developments. This application site is identified by policy SAH10I in its totality, that's 0.66 hectares, as suitable for 20 dwellings. However, the application has been subject to significant amendment following its original submission in March 2018, which was for 18 dwellings. Following consultation and negotiation with the Council's flood risk management team, it was concluded that the lower portion of the site was not suitable for residential development. This was due to overriding concerns with regard to the level of flood risk. Accordingly, the site boundary has been reduced to approximately 0.4 hectares and permission, as I stated earlier, is now sought for only nine dwellings. Officers are satisfied that whilst the site will ultimately deliver less than the intended LDP target, given the overriding technical constraint on site, the number proposed is now acceptable. With regard to affordable housing, as stated earlier, the scheme would deliver two affordable dwellings on site which is in accordance with the requirement of 35% as set out in policy S4. In terms of visual impact, the dwellings themselves are of good size, but officers are of the view that they are comparable to those in the immediate context, including those immediately to the west and those that <coughs> are situated along the frontage of Buriam Gate, and as such would not disrupt the street seam in terms of balance, scale or proportion. As I stated earlier, the layout follows the linear form of buildings along Monmouth Road, and the slight differences in the building line are considered to add depth and visual interest, and as such are welcomed. In terms of external materials, these are considered appropriate to the context, although samples would be agreed via planning condition. And accordingly, individual detailing, including dormers, bay windows, etc., are considered to be reasonable and well-balanced. Whilst the site does not accord with a maximum density of 30 dwellings per hectare as detailed in policy DES 1, given the edge of settlement location, officers, including the council's urban design officer, considered that this would have resulted in a cramped form of development and therefore the resultant layout is appropriate to the edge of town location. With regard to local residential amenity impact, the revised layout and reduction from 18 to, 17, 18 to 7 units means that there's no longer any dwelling positioned adjacent to number six, Court Brindowin. The nearest neighboring property sits immediately to the west of the site, which you've seen on screen, that's Danakoiv. Plot one, which is closest to this property and, and positioned side on, would be set slightly further back from Monmouth Road. However, would feature no windows, either ground or first floor, or other openings on the west elevation facing towards it. Therefore, existing levels of residential privacy and amenity would be being maintained. The gable to gable distance, as I said, is considered to be acceptable. With regards to highway safety, the council's highway engineer offers no objection to the proposal, confirming that it would not be detrimental or lead to deterioration to highway safety or capacity 
on the local highway network. Just to confirm a point from yesterday's site visit, the site is located within a 30 mile an hour zone, which increases to the national speed limit approximately 100 metres to the east. In terms of off-street parking requirements, each dwelling is fully policy compliant and would have sufficient room to turn within the site and enter onto Monmouth Road in a forward gear. With regard to green infrastructure and landscape, the retention of the hedgerow along the front and reinforced hedgerow planting along the eastern edge are particularly welcome. Whilst a protected ash tree is proposed to be felled, this has been subject to consultation with both the council's tree officer and biodiversity officer. The trees within the southern field parcel are now to be retained and a new soft landscaping scheme has been submitted which includes new tree planting to compensate for those lost. Uh, the importance of the site as a gateway into the town is recognised and officers are now satisfied that the revised scheme will provide a suitable soft edge to the edge of the settlement that adjoins open countryside. With regard to flooding, the original proposal did include land within flood zone C2 which in itself raised obvious significant concerns to officers. Uh, in addition, third party representations also confirmed that the lower portion uh, was subject to regular local flooding. However, given the amendment to the site boundary, including removing all parts within the flood zone, the council's flood risk management team have confirmed that the changes have addressed original concerns by limiting development to the upper northern section of the site only. Finally, with regard to drainage, it is proposed that the development will be served by a gravity file water system draining to the adopted sewer in the public highway to the northwest of the site. This would be offered up to do a Cymru Welsh water for adoption. In addition, the submitted drainage strategy sets out that where the proximity of existing and proposed structures prevents the use of soakways, permeable surfaces and drainage blankets beneath the proposed drive areas would be employed to dispose of the surface water. Uh, on this point, um, the original condition set out in the officer report seeks a drainage scheme to be submitted. For subject to members' agreement, it is probably reasonable for that condition to be amended to a compliance condition with that uh, scheme. And therefore, subject to the section 106 agreement to secure the two affordable units and the conditions set out in the officer's report, the application is presented to you today with a recommendation for approval. Councillor yeah. Freakins. Thank you, Chair. I think it's fantastic design, really, really well thought out. Uh, I'm very happy that uh, it's been reduced in number uh, and the number of representatives today, I think, like you said, Andrew, it provides a um, uh, a lovely scene coming into uh, into the town, uh, so I'd be more than happy to propose that we accept it. And, um, I also welcome it and um, thank all the officers for all their work they've done it over the past year or more. Um, also, is it possible to talk with the um, developers with regard to any electric charging points? I don't know if it's relevant nowadays, but perhaps um, Craig could uh, point out. Um, the regulation. We, I don't think we have it in an actual policy regard to that yet, do we? Thank you. Thank you. And I'm prepared to second the proposal. Sorry. Um, yes. Um, this is obviously something that we're giving significant thought for in terms of the climate change emergency that the council has announced. Um, we are gi giving significant uh, consideration to how we deal with climate change mitigation in the replacement local development plan. Um, obviously, this site has been allocated within this local development plan and um, the viability has been reviewed and we haven't got any policies in relation to, in, to EV charging, to solar panels, to renewables, to any sort of development resilience in terms of mitigation. But I can assure you this, this is something that I'm personally looking into. We had a members workshop last week, um, which I know some members were there um, to, to discuss these topics. And it's something that we would be looking at in the replacement local development plan to have policies which specifically look look at um, how we deal with uh, mitigating any development um, in relation to climate change. So it's something that we're looking at. Unfortunately, in this local development plan, we don't have any policies at the moment. Um, but going forward, we certainly want to be um, sort of front runners in making sure that we, we have that development resilience in our policies. Thank you, Craig. Yep, Councillor Louise. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I think it's uh, looking on site. It's a very good scheme. And I'm pleased to see that it's been um, 
reduced so that it's not in any any flood zone at all now. Um, one of the things is that um, uh, the reason um, uh, I do like the scheme is because it seems to match with the housing nearby um, in terms of its um, the picture we've seen of the soft render and and stones and, and so forth um, on the exterior of the properties. But I can't find any uh, condition on materials um, flicking through. And I just wondered if we could add that to it because uh, unless I've missed it somewhere. Thank you. Just to pick on that point, Councillor Browns. No, that, that's, that's probably an officer error, which is myself. Uh, as that is actually referenced in the, but the body of the report. So, um, no, that, that's an officer error. But thank you for spotting. And yes, that that can be added. Thank you. Uh, if any of you read the report, <clears throat> on page twenty-three, it says no construction will take place between seven thirty and six Monday to Friday. <laughs> It actually should say construction will take place on Monday to Friday. So. <laughs> um, it's condition 12, it is. As the builders are at the back, they haven't noticed either. So. Um. All those in favor, please show. Okay, it's carried. Thank you very much indeed. We now go on to application number 01720 on pages 31 for uh, Worthy Brook Farm, Old Hendra Road, Wanastow. Yep, Philip, please. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, yeah, so this, this is an application for alterations and conversion of existing agricultural buildings to form a two-bedroom dwelling unit with ancillary works at Worthy Brook Farm, Old Hendra Road, Wanastow. Uh, some of us were there yesterday. Uh, we'll just have a quick run through the photo. This is the field gate access looking up um, to the site. That's the building in question behind the sort of vine growing out of it. Uh, the stone element is to the left-hand side, and then there's a lean-to blockwork element there with a blockwork um, larger projection that you see towards the right-hand side there, which we'll get a better view of there. That's the lean-to, which I just mentioned. You see the stone element there with the pitch roof, which we have another photograph of here. And that's the other side of it, looking back towards the, uh, the axis over on the right-hand side. Um, and then that's the larger... Um, uh, blockwork utilitarian really um, building which uh, you can see uh, and then that's another view of it perhaps it puts it in context better that one you can see the stone element there at the far end of the, the, the picture and then the more utilitarian element there in front of us uh, and then that's another angle of it and that's uh, we'll get on to the plans now so the proposal seeks the conversion of the disused farm buildings to residential use the application site is a complex of outbuildings situated in an isolated but prominent position on the highway connecting Wanastow to Dingerstow. And one building is constructed in stone, as we saw from the photographs, with a concrete tiled roof, uh, with a modern blockwork lean-to at the side, while the other buildings are made up of modern blockwork and timber boarding construction. Just have a get to the block plan there, so that shows it in context. Um, so if I just point out where we are. That's the original, what I call original building, which is the stone, more attractive element with the pitch roof. That's the smaller lean-to blockwork building, and that's the lean-to, uh, sorry, the pitch roof blockwork building at the rear. And then this would be a new link to meet the old and the utilitarian element there. So there's a long history to this site, uh, with a previous proposal for the conversion of the buildings uh, that was refused and then dismissed at appeal. The most recent decision, decision at this site related to the refusal of application DC 2007-01070, and that was a, a similar proposal in terms of um, uh, alteration and, and conversion of those buildings. 
Uh, notwithstanding that the LDP has been adopted since those decisions, the key issues remain that the conversion relies on utilising extensive uh, building elements that are concrete block, utilitarian structures. And these have to be timber clad to make the barn conversion look attractive and, in inverted commas, finished. And this facet would be contrary to criterion E of LDP policy H4. And that sets out uh, criterion E. Buildings of modern and or utilitarian construction and materials, such as concrete block work, portal frame buildings, clad in metal sheeting, or buildings of substandard quality and or incongruous appearance, will not be considered favorably, favorably for residential conversion. Other buildings, will, and this is, this is a separate clause now, other buildings will be expected to have been used for their intended purpose for a significant period of time, particularly close scrutiny will be given to proposals relating to those less than 10 years old, especially where there's been no change in activity on the, on the unit. So the important thing to remember is that is a separate clause. So that's, that's, for, that's relating to buildings which are of a more uh, attractive nature, which would be more suitable for conversion rather than the utilitarian elements, which are, which are uh, unacceptable in their own right. This advice is amplified in the Council's adopted supplementary planning guidance on rural building conversions, adopted in November 2017. And this states in relation to determining the suitability of a conversion, and I quote, modern and utilitarian buildings are designed to be functional and are not generally considered to be aesthetically pleasing. These buildings are often of an industrial character and due to their design and modern construction methods are unlikely to be suitable for residential conversion. Modern construction methods include, but are not limited to, not limited to steel frame construction, buildings clad in metal sheeting, corrugated sheets, concrete block work, and plastic, unquote. In addition to this issue, the host building, i.e. the old bit, with the, the, the stonework, without the modern lean-to lean block work structure to the side, measures approximately 34 square metres taken externally while the more modern outbuilding to the rear measures 51 square metres. The modern lean-to element for the proposed kitchen adds a further 16.5 square metres. And in total, the modern block work element accounts for almost double the floor area of the existing host building. So that's 34 me square metres and 66.5 square metres, respectively. This is the reason why such a significant part of this development would be faced with waning edge timber, as this covers up the block work on the scheme. It's concluded that the proposal fails to comply with criterion E of H4 uh, and the provisions of the SPG that require that buildings proposed for rural conversion should be capable of providing adequate living space within the existing structure, including ancillary spaces such as garaging. So, um, so the application is recommended for refusal on the basis of failure to comply with these two key aspects of policy H4. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. The local member would like to address planning committee. You have six minutes, Councillor John. F thank you very much. Thank you for the for the opportunity to to say a few words about this application. Um, the the application um, before you today proposes to uh, convert um, a, an eyesore of of outbuildings to a habitable accommodation in uh, what is a, a beautiful location just outside the hamlet of, of Wanastow. This is a resubmitted application which has been significantly changed um, from uh, its, its predecessor. It's been significantly reduced in scale um, from, from what was previously refused, reduced by over 50%. Um, the defective outbuildings um, which, which have been referred to, have, have been omitted from this latest um, submission. A consulting engineer's report on the buildings to be retained within this development are deemed suitable for, for conversion and considered to be in serviceable condition. This application has given full consideration to the rural setting, um, both in terms of its design and finishing. The, the application does not have the, the modern urban style and characteristics of the, the previous application. Um, the resubmission proposes to lower the floor level of the building by adopting an un underpinning exercise to accommodate a two-storey element. The underpinning is not untypical of barn conversions and will enhance the foundations of the existing stone walls. 
Um, it also increases the scale and the usable space in the building. Planning officers have indicated to the, the applicant and agent that they would support conversion of the buildings as a holiday let. Um, now, I, I struggle with this because I, I feel that the appearance, the design, and the scale of the development would be exactly the same as for residential use. Um, so I'm confused as to why um, we would say that building conditions are deemed suitable for conversion to a holiday let, but not residential. Um, the agent on behalf of the applicant has formally drawn attention to many similar uh, developments which have been given planning permission um, within the authority. Um, and the, the applicant is concerned that um, the, the authority could be seen to be um, could be seen to be um, um, could be seen to be inconsistent in in some ways having uh, approved some some similar applications for conversions of, of ancillary structures. Um, this development, which includes an original stone barn structure of considerable age, together with conversion of ancillary buildings built in the 1950s would not be deemed modern in accordance with planning records and previous reports as submitted and approved on other applications. Now, I, I understand that the applicant, should this application not be approved today, I understand that the applicant uh, is minded to consider submitting a formal appeal. Um, the application has received a number of uh, many letters of support from uh, nearby neighbours and the Mitchell Troy Community Council. They all recognise the need for affordable housing uh, in, in rural Monmouthshire. The proposed development, um, as I understand, meets all supplementary planning guidelines um, and there has been uh, no local objections to this proposed development. Um, development of this site for residential use would, visit, uh, would uh, visually enhance the area and would ensure that those buildings which are falling into disrepair would be removed. Um, I would be concerned that if this isn't developed, this site will continue to be an eyesore uh, in, in what's a, a really beautiful part of the world. I've spoken to a number of neighbours who understandably would be opposed to any development in, in the open countryside, but they, they recognise that this is a conversion to bring um, some, some fairly ugly buildings back into, uh, back, back into use as a, as a home. So thank you all for your consideration and I hope that members will consider uh, approving this application. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Councillor. Lauren Powell. Thank you, Chairman. Well, I had a good look at that yesterday and I'm sorry, but I do feel there is not <coughs> enough of stonework there to make it a, a, a well uh, converted barn. Um, we lived in a house which actually was a house, but they was referred to as a converted barn for many years. And I mean, you, you do need to have a good deal of stonework to make it feasible and to make it look right in the countryside. And I, I understand the query over holiday lets, but um, they are asking for a dwelling, and I'm afraid I cannot go with it, and I go for refusal. Thank you. Councillor Howard. I second uh, Maureen's proposal. I think the key difference for me with a holiday let, you can argue that's a rural diversification and possibly come under the, under the auspices of, of TAN 6, um, whereas as, as, a, as permanent dwelling is development in the countryside and in what is an unsustainable location outside of the settlement boundary. That's the, the big difference. I, I think Maureen is right. There's not enough stone in there. There's not enough architectural merit to the, the, the buildings or enough visual worth in there to, to retain them without there being massive... Um, reconstruction and it is clearly a, a, a against the policy so I, I support my, what Maureen has said. Thank you very much. Anybody else wish to make a comment? So you've moved refusal Maureen have you? And you've seconded it Charles. All those for refusal please show. Anybody for approval? No. Okay. The application is lost. We now, we now move on to uh, 271 dwellings at Crick, although the figure should read 269. So we're going to take these two application elements together, a care room as well? Yes, we can do. Yeah, yeah. As a, yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
So uh, I deal with the um, housing scheme first. Um, yeah, just to clarify, it's um, owing to a reduction in the number of units, which has uh, arrived up for a number of reasons, including there being more open space, more privacy space on the site, and the fact that we've got seven bungalows on the site, which uh, 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 generally a little bit more land hungry than, than houses, then the, the number has been reduced to 269 dwelling units. Uh, the good news is we're, we're getting 68 affordable housing units, which is policy compliant. That number hasn't dropped. And that includes seven two-bedroom bungalows as well, which I know will ple please the chair. So uh, members will be aware that this is a strategic site in the LDP, granted outline planning permission for up to 291 dwellings, a care home and public open space landscaping and associated infrastructure. Uh, and that, that was uh, approved in March 2019. So the application is for the residential element of the application, and that's for 269 homes. 68, as I've said, of these would be affordable, which is 25% of the total and is therefore policy compliant for the seven side area. And this 11 hectare site is a greenfield one south of the B4275, uh, sorry, B4245 rather, west of the disused railway line and the Castlegate Business Park, north of Treetops Housing Estate and the remainder of Port Skewit. So, um, yeah, just looking at it on this plan, it's in this area. I'll just run, th run quickly through some of the pictures. That's the actual junction with Crick Road, uh, and the site is over on the right-hand side. And that's looking across, uh, if, we, if you were there, at various site visits we've had on this site in the past. That's the, the lay-by we parked in. We looked over at the site, which falls away from that part of the site down towards the, the disused railway line. You can see treetops in the far distance. That's a similar shot. Uh, and then that's looking the other direction towards the uh, David Broom Event Centre, towards the main road there and the site frontage, which has got a hedgerow running along it. And then that's looking towards the, the, uh, the, this part of the site that aligns with Crick Road, uh, and those are some of the mature oak trees that are going to be retained in the public open space in that part of the site. And then that's looking back across the site, back towards uh, Crick Road, uh, and looking again at some of those mature trees from from within the site. And that's the site um, application OS plan. I'll leave it on the uh, actual site layout plan for the moment. The proposal has been developed following lengthy discussions with your officers and fully embraces the green infrastructure approach to residential layouts and design. There is a hierarchy of routes proposed, and these include the creation of a, of a greenway forming an extension of the main village street running alongside retained and new hedgerows. So we've got the greenway running from that lay-by area all the way through alongside the main access into the site, uh, running all the way alongside the care home and linking up eventually what will be linked up to the disused railway line, which will eventually become a uh, pedestrian footpath and cycleway. Uh, the access from Crick Road, um, sorry, that, so there are secondary streets which serve the majority of the housing phases in a series of mews and private drives uh, along with main pedestrian routes. The access from Crick Road serves a secondary road that is deliberately more arduous by design for motorists than the private access to the site of the B4245. So the intention is to make that route less attractive because it's going to be more circuitous uh, than this more direct route into the site which will serve the vast swathes of development uh, rather than as it's obviously these houses will go via the Crick Road development but it will be easier for these sort of these houses down in this corner to go this way it's more direct and out. The outline planning consent secured improvements in connections to Port Skewit and Caldicott and these have been delivered through the pedestrian footways being created along Crick Road linking the site to the existing residential area to the south and the schools and amenities in Port Skewit. The footpath provision along the main road, the B4245, provides links with Caldicott and the employment areas to the west. The developers have sought to deliver permeability within the site with footpaths that connect areas within the site to these key footpath links outside of the site. So there's all sorts of flows through the site, from greenways running along here through the... Uh, in and around the care home, 
and we went through the tracks and walk, walkways that is here and along here, and there's even walkways from this part just like through along here, and then out onto the main road. So it's, it's a highly permeable form of development. There are lots of green spaces running through it, linking up into some attractive spaces, central play area here. So it's highly permeable and been well thought through in terms of GI. There's some lots of open space in this northern part of the uh, sort of eastern part of the site, just quick run. Um, as I've said, there's amenity spaces all the way through the site. Um, the siting and layout of the dwellings have been carefully considered to minimise the impact of the development upon the surrounding properties. There is specific regard to the siting of the new properties in relation to the southern and eastern boundaries to ensure that they do not adversely affect the amenity or privacy currently enjoyed by the occupiers of properties along treetops, which is along the southeastern boundary, and Arthur's Close, which is uh, towards down in this area. Uh, the privacy distances um, for the units in those areas provide a minimum of 10.5 metres separating distance to common boundaries and 21 metres between first floor windows. So we just have a run through some of the plans as well. So the pink uh, uh, plan shows where the affordable housing is, is located throughout the site. Uh, those show, show uh, the attractive street scenes the diversity of uh, forms in terms of small terraces, semis and detached houses with different colours and materials to help orientate yourself through the site, which is uh, important, bearing in mind it'll be close to the care home which will contain uh, and accommodate dementia patients. That's the care home that shows how it links up with the housing and shows a degree of um, green space around it uh, in that part of the site. Um, sorry, so I've gone past that. I'll uh, leave that on that, that part. Um, so the design of the houses, uh, we've actually put a lot of plans out this morning for you to have a look at. Um, uh, so the, there were lots of individual plans there for members to see. Um, they're traditional with eight different house types proposed for the private housing, finished in either red clay multi-facing brick or through coloured render to the walls, both with either uh, imitation roof slates or concrete interlocking terra terracotta tiles. The same finishes are desi and design are consistent with the range of affordable housing proposed for the site. And the affordable ho housing units include seven two-bedroom bungalows. And the layout of the streets has been devised to be dementia-friendly by a variety of means, including making the spaces very distinctive and easy to orientate. Changes in building forms and scale, as well as variation in materials, help way marking. Public areas are overlooked with properties orientated appropriately, and footpaths are overlooked uh, by adjacent properties, thus ensuring that public spaces have surveillance and people are made to feel safe. The site layout, uh, with excellent links and green corridors, encourages interaction and non-car movement. In respect of the concern raised by neighbours over hedgerow maintenance along the eastern boundary, which I'll point out in this plan, uh, so that's an area, this area here, um, it's adjacent to the pumping station. The developer has confirmed that this will be covered by a maintenance company who will be responsible, subject to the specific, specific, ugh, specification given in the GI management plan, which is subject to a separate discharge of condition application. So in conclusion with the housing element, we endorse this proposal as well-considered housing layout that creates an interesting and distinctive place where people will enjoy living, working, and socialising. We would recommend approval for that element subject to the conditions set out in the report and the additional condition in late correspondence regarding the details of the pumping station. Um, in relation to the care home, um, as it, that's uh, been subject to, uh, again, lots of details being, ah, oh, there we are, over there, uh, set out for the members. Um, it's, it's a single-storey, 32-bed care home, the design ethos which has, been which has shaped the proposal is based on the creation of a dementia-friendly environment, and the care home has been designed around a central communal garden courtyard area with a U-shaped building. And within the courtyard is a gathering space as a focal point in the form of a standalone single-storey structure. And this building differs in form with a slightly steeper pitch and a higher ridge line than that of the main care home. And that's the area where people will congregate in terms of there'll be uh, choirs held there, hairdressing uh, elements will go on there. It's where people will go to meet up and congregate. The proposed care facility is centred 
on the creation of four individual houses, in inverted commas, and although individually they adjoin each other uh, in the creation of this big U-shaped building, um, each house comprises of eight ensuite bedrooms, assisted bathroom, communal kitchen, dining area, a snug, a lounge and a garden room. There are also ancillary rooms in the form of storerooms, linen stores and WCs. And there are two central staff complexes accommodating the staff room, staff sleeping room and associated ensuite, staff changing room and a laundry room. Uh, there'll also be um, a communal nature sensory room within the footprint on the main care home, while each house is served by four individual secure gardens that lead onto the central communal garden in the middle. In line with the ph philosophy to create four houses, each house has been designed to accommodate pitch roofs with domestic proportions, whilst the staff complexes and ancillary rooms, along with the communal sensory room, have been designed with flat roofs and connect the, the dwellings as ancillary elements to the main building. There's really been a lot of thought gone into the design and form of the building, the spaces within and around the building to make it as um, uh, you know, successful a space for the, uh, for the uh, residents uh, and the staff working there as possible. There are integrated solar panels to be provided on the outside facing roofs on the west, east and south elevations. And only the south and east elevation is in the public domain. Um, and they, so, um, so in the, in the east elevation, closest to the frontage and main axis of the site, there won't be any panels because we'll keep that uh, roof finish as clean looking as possible. Um, ample parking is proposed for the care home for staff and visitors. There'll be a total of 32 spaces. 24 spaces for staff and eight for visitors. Um, architecturally, the site delivers a very attractive form of development, blending contemporary design with traditional portions and form. And the development is broken up by the varying building lines and roof lines. And thus, while the care facility is a large as a single unit, it would not be overbearing within the street scene as it is low. The proposed landscaping around the outside of the care home has a number of roles, and the retained hedgerow to the east forms a common boundary between the care home and the wider resi residential area. And this coupled with tree planting, and the um, tree planting adjacent to the hedgerow separates the public walkway that I've showed you. Sorry, let's get to the uh, site plan. So that the, uh, the walkway here, there'll be, there'll be hedgerows to actually uh, to create privacy between the care home and that central walk, walk through, which the residents themselves can enjoy as well. There'll be no overlooking or overbearing impact from any part of this, this element of the scheme. Um, and the care home has been designed with each house having access to their own individual garden that leads on again to the open shared community garden. So this encourages engagement with others and active living that comes with maintenance and upkeep of these shared spaces. Uh, and, and indeed, uh, the, the gathering space is a community hub that is a destination for the residents to visit and attend. So to conclude, the architectural design of the buildings and surrounding spaces, enclosed community space and outside spaces enable it to become a distinctive and integral part of the site within the street setting, but also in how residents of this site and beyond can integrate with each other as part of a wider community. So we feel this is an excellent proposal and we would certainly endorse its approval subject to the conditions set out in the report. So we'd endorse both aspects of the scheme, residential and care home. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Councillor Higginson. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the officers for the amount of work they put into this. Because originally, it was, uh, there was more houses to be uh, um, built there than what is now something about 20 more. Um, there's a lot of thought going into that and uh, in, into, into what's presented for us here now. And an, ex an excellent description of the, prop the type of properties, and in particular the care home, and um, because it's adjacent to my ward, which is why I want to speak on it, and it's going to complement the area. There's no argument about it, and I move we accept it. Thank you, Thank you very much, Councillor Eason. I concur with everything Councillor Dickinson says. Um, I also note uh, that we had a, a correspondence from, uh, from, a co from a resident in Rocket. Uh, that mat the matter in that actual letter is being dealt with by Lower Wai and by Seven Side Area Committees um, to try and resolve some of those problems. So I, su I support this. It's, it's sat, sat long enough. Now we need to move on. And equally, the care home, if we don't get some movement on the care home in the next 12 months, we could lose our support from the Welsh Government. Thank you. Councillor David Evans. Anybody else wish to comment? 
want to say? Comment or vote? Comment. Comment. Charles? Thank you. Yeah, I'd uh, su support the comments of the officers' hard, hard work and uh, the report took a lot of putting together, I'm sure. There's just two suggestions I was going to make um, for, for conditions, and one of them is my favorite one about retention of parking areas for, for that purpose only, or words to that effect. Um, if, if people do develop to the side, you know what will happen, and it affects the street scene as well. Um, also, there's details of all the materials in there. Is it worth considering um, conditioning those as well? Because you, a, lot, a lot of these larger developments look great. Maybe 10 years on, they still look great. Then you get elements of indi individuality and the, the sense of uniformity and sense of place. And I, I think it's lost when people start modifying the properties above and beyond um, the, the, the consent. I think the, the render and brick finishes are, are, are fine, but you know, I've seen some pretty horrible things that can, can really detract from a larger development. So should we consider um, putting a condition on there. I don't know how you'd word it because obviously you, you wouldn't want to stop somebody changing a the, the render to a different color, but possibly PVC cladding and, and elements of a, just just wouldn't look very good. Um, I also note the, the email from the resident, which we'll see this afternoon. Um, I appreciate the, the, the points that were, were raised in there about the issues of con congestion traffic. I also note this is a st strategic site that's got outline consent already. Um, we put our hands up for this a, a very long time ago when we discussed the LDP, but I take note of everything that's raised in there, and without wanting to prolong the debate, we see it in neighboring cities, don't we? Na uh, Newport, Cardiff, lots of development, absolutely chock-a-block, and I bet every application has been supported by a transport assessment that, that shows there'll be no problem whatsoever on the adjoining network, but now we're talk talking about congestion charges, so the points do have, have hit home, but this one, it's, a, it's an outline consent, and it's a strategic site, and I, I, I support it, and, and the work that's been done on it. Thank you, Councillor Peakins. Thank you, Chair. And just to uh, thank the officers, really, because this is an example of site um, that I think we should all be very proud of, in as much as that the connectivity between the site and through the site with all the green spaces, for me, is probably one of the best um, results that I've ever seen of any development. Um, and that's only down to the determination and hard work of officers and the willingness also of the promoters. Um, but I think that we should be incredibly proud that this has come forward and. Uh, and yeah, I'm happy to move to vote. Thank you. Councillor Brown. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I, I mean, I support the uh, idea that, um, you know, obviously having a, a dementia-friendly um, urban design is a good thing, and um, a lot of work has gone into this. Um, and I also support uh, Councillor Howard's um, recommendation of some extra conditions on it. Um, I noticed that there wasn't a construction um, statement. I know this is a virgin site, but obviously it does affect people in Port Skewit in terms of um, uh, traffic coming and going. And I just wondered, you know, and obviously grit or dirt on the road and so forth. So it will be helpful if, if there was some form of condition on um, that particular aspect. And obviously, with regard to transport assessment, I'm very much in favour of uh, widening it because obviously we know about the congestion in my area and in um, Chepstow. But um, the other point I wanted to make was about um, pl uh, planning uh, policy Wales at edition 10, um, which talks about um, uh, uh, sort of cycling, walking and so forth. And I know we've, we've talked quite a bit about walking routes and things like that, but one of my concerns is also about um, bus, bus transport and making sure that there are um, I mean, I know there's the uh, B4235, which I assume will have some bu bus stops, but also, um, you know, making sure that there are some bus stops within the actual um, site itself, because um, some of the um, people who are currently in Seven View Home um, in, in Chepstow might be transferred as care patients to the Crick Road development. And they've got their, that development is very close to the centre of Chepstow with um, the bus station nearby. And obviously, um, for visitors and so forth, I think it's important that um, there is public transport um, uh, to visit spouses and family um, located within the site, including near the 
uh, care home and I did actually raise this issue about bus stops um, but it is part of um, uh, planning policy Wales which says that you've got to look at a hierarchy of, of things like um, walking cycling and um, bus transport and I don't see anything about um, bus stops and bus uh, bus transport and you know I mean for example on the B4325 it's quite busy and you know is there you know, is there going to be adequate um, sort of bus shelters and um, uh, sort of areas where you don't have to actually stand in the mud to uh, 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 catch a bus? And I, I just think it's an important area that needs to be um, properly considered. Thank you. Just cover that, yeah. In terms of a couple of points, the construction traffic management plan. I was corrected, 4245, sorry. Yeah, that's it, yeah, yeah the, the B road, yeah. Um, in terms of the construction and traffic management, there's a condition in the outline to require that. So, in effect, the outline is the planning permission. This is the reserve matters, the discharge conditions. So, we have to look at it like that. In terms of bus provision, there was a 50,000 contribution within the Section 106 agreement for this site to be used in improving the local bus services. How that is then used is up to the local, um, well, the local councils. Uh, transport department really in terms of sustainable transport in terms of assessing where where the improvements need to be made whether those are put directly into bus services or indeed they do put bus stops within have it running through this site um, it may be that they deem that it's it's better to have uh, bus bus stops on the on the main road network and that people walk or cycle uh, you know from this site I walk to the bus stops um, there are Yeah. You know, sorry, not everybody yeah, I mean, the is, uh, they, they might it, be on yeah. frail and so... Yeah, we you know. can't insist there are bus stops put in this site. It's, we've got the £50,000 contribution via the 106. How they use that and how they deem that is then spent in terms of improving the bus network in the areas is a matter for them. I mean, you're welcome to speak to them or we can speak to them on your behalf about this site um, and we can talk to estates about that as well. Um, but... Um, uh, that's really a matter for them to uh, decide how that money is allocated and spent. Yep. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to reiterate into, uh, in terms oh, of your, your praise, in terms of the, uh, what planning officers have done with this site. Yeah. Um, we are really, really proud of the development team approach that's been done on this site. Um, our green infrastructure team, planning officers, highway officers have all worked collectively together to get this scheme together. And it is exemplar i think it's one of the best schemes i've seen and i'm really really proud to present it to you as members um it's got loads of green infrastructure in, in, infused in the site all of the development looks out onto these open spaces it's been designed with dementia in, in mind i really feel that it's making a place rather than actually just creating a development it is completely in line with what we should be doing as, as developments go in line with what planning policy wales is is striving for and as I say, I think that we, the, the team who've got together with Candleston to do this, um, it's a really successful scheme. And I think it's, it's, it's aligned with what you as members have expressed to us in terms of the design of the dwellings. They're very traditional. We've got chimneys, we've got overhangs. We've got that detail in there. We've got that variation. I just wanted to express that I am really, really proud of the team on this in terms of how, how they've delivered um, and negotiated with the developer to bring the scheme to bring this scheme forward. Obviously, as well with the care home, um, it, it's of a very high de design, contemporary design, and it will be fit for purpose, giving the residents of, of those areas a real good life and, and, and thinking about their future generations. So I just want to express, really, the, how proud I am in terms of that. In terms of the permeability of the site, um, yes, um, Councillor Brown, you're completely correct. Um, this site has been designed with perme permeability in mind in terms of cycling and um, pedestrian links, and we have got uh, many from the Section 106 to develop the, the railway line as well, so that is part of the active travel links with highways department, so they'll be able to work on that. Just wanted to pick up on a few of those points. Thank you all very much. Yes, David, next. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I think this is a, a, a great scheme as well. I, I think it's uh, very good that he. And I, some of the things I was going to say has been 
already said, said by Councillor Brown. But one of the things that I, I think we ought to be looking at with new schemes that we're putting in now, it's a bit a uh, future-proof thing. Um, if you look at some of the estates that we have that are not hugely old, the big issue now is car parking. And what happens is where there are green areas, people park on the green areas. I mean, we've got one estate in the Ruffitt where the car parking now is coming down the green. And the public expect, Mon CC, they don't get it, the public expect that Mon <coughs> CC will make parking provision for them. And as Roger said uh, to me, he said, he said, you've got to tell them that Mon, Mon CC isn't actually responsible for for parking. So w what concerns me uh, about this is, is state is that it needs protecting from its own residents because they, they will continue to buy motor cars and they will park them anywhere and everywhere. And if you look at some of the estates that are being built throughout the UK now, it is very, very difficult for anybody to park more than two cars anywhere on the estate. So I, all I'm saying is, if we want to keep it uh, the exemplar, if you like, of good design, we've got to do something about the problem of car litter where the car is the litter. And it, it, it is really bad because it destroys uh, fences, it destroys greenery, it, it's bad. So it, it, I, all I want you to do is have a look <coughs> at that and see how you can make sure that um, the, the spa spare space, which should be green and pleasant, isn't abused by the residents because they will if they can. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, David. Um, so, um, uh, Councillor Howard suggested um, make sure that the car parking spaces are retained. Yeah. For that purpose only, and on, on um, any ever built on via some yeah. um, permitted development yeah. um, action, yeah. if you like, or action via permitted development exercise of permit, for permitted development rights. Oh, well, well. We can also, um, we, we were considering what Councillor Howe was saying about loss of, uh, you know, erosion of the quality of the development through changing materials. Um, we'd certainly remove permitted development rights for. For roof extensions, because that could look you can you can build some quite unsightly <laughs> dormer dormer developments these days. Um, it, it depends how far you want to go. Really, do you really want to stop somebody painting the render a different colour? Um, I'm not sure. That's something that perhaps members need to decide. Could I make a suggestion that perhaps consideration of those conditions is is for the delegated panel to to have some time to think about it. Thank you very much. Um, as you know, Ruth's not here this afternoon. Roger and I haven't had an opportunity to look at the detail yet. With your permission, can we just have a glance at it before it finally goes off to the to the developer? Is that all right, boys? As soon as possible. Next day or two. You do want to send it tomorrow. It has been to the panel. It has been to the panel. You have looked at the... No, you you, it's, the, the pla you have you have looked at the detail. Yes. One of my um, things to mention has been via your via our uh, highly esteemed design. Thank you very much. Okay, we've had a long discussion about it. Would somebody like to move its approval, please? That's both that's both applications. Okay, Councillor Higginson and Councillor Eason. We let you local boys uh, have it. All those in favour, please show. Oh, I'm not voting. Am I? Okay, we have one more application to go on this afternoon, and it's Councillor Ger uh. Thank you, Chair. Yep, this is a full application for the change of use of land to accommodate two park homes and up to four touring caravans that traveller needs, and to confirm it will be for a private family site. The site is located along the A48, just on the eastern edge of Crick, and 
the application is presented to you today, members. Has there been objections from five or more separate households, as well as a request from the ward member? So for any members that weren't on site yesterday, we'll just quickly run again through some site photographs. It's a view of the site then, looking from the A48. That's a view taken from within the site, looking towards the east. You can see the neighbouring property in the distance. Yep. yep. And that's just another view, internal view, taken from within the site. Uh, the extent of the application site then is on the next slide. You can see that edged in red. So it's proposed that the park homes would be used by the applicant and his young family occupying the three-bed unit. And if we can just show the three-bed unit on the site layout, Phil. Yep, so there's three a three-bed unit. Area. Yep. And his elder son and young family would accommodate the two-bedroom unit. Um, examples of these park homes are shown on screen also. So that's the two-bed unit and that's the three-bed unit. So the touring pitches would be used for travelling members of the wider family visiting the area and would not be open to the general travelling community. Also, as part of this application, the previously approved stables would be used to provide shower rooms, toilets and day room facilities within the park home, uh, within to provide, and these would be provided to the east of the park home buildings. The intervening space, which is shown as the hatched area on the layout plan, uh, this space between the buildings and the park homes would be used to accommodate the touring caravans uh, I mentioned just before. In addition, a, a cesspit septic tank would be on, provided on the land to the southwest of the enclosed area, and vehicle access would be provided by the existing entrance onto day 48 and a with the tarmac drive leading to the accommodation area. Uh, finally, just to confirm, the applicant has actively participated in the latest and most recent Gypsy and Travel Accommodation Assessment and details the applicant's personal circumstances and subsequent need are available in the documents that have been submitted in support of this application. So with regard then to the detailed considerations, the policy framework against which the proposal should be assessed is set out in the LDP, uh, Planning Policy Wales Edition 10, and in particular Welsh Government Circular 005 2018 planning for gypsy and traveller and show people sites. The adopted LDP does not provide the specific site allocation for gypsies and travellers. It does, however, contain the criteria-based policy H8 relating to the development of gypsy and traveller sites. And this provides the framework for assessing proposal proposals and should be considered <coughs> accordingly. In terms of circular 005 2018, uh, this identifies that some gypsy and travellers may wish to find and buy their own sites to develop and manage themselves. This is opposed to having sites provided and run by the local authority. And this is the case in this instance. The applicant owns this land and wishes to develop it for himself and his family. The Housing Wales Act 2014 places a legal duty upon local authorities to ensure that the accommodation needs of gypsies and travellers are properly assessed and the identified need for pitches is met. Under the latest GTAA, it has been identified that Monmouthshire has a need to provide eight pitches and with increasing need projected as part of the review. In terms of its location, the site is located in close proximity to the village of Crick. The site is located outside of any settlement boundary and uh, set out in the LDP. And this means that it is regarded as being in the open countryside where there is a general presumption against development unless the proposal accords with national planning policy or specific policies in the adopted LDP. Policy H8 sets out that locations should be within reasonable travelling distance of a settlement with services and community facilities, including health and education. Whilst the GTAA has identified that there is a need for provision within the county, at this time the council do not have any allocated sites within the LDP. Therefore, there are no viable alternative locations available for immediate occupation, other than the private provision as provo proposed. Although Crick lacks services, the site is within approximately one and a half kilometres of Caldicott, where there's a primary school, shops and healthcare facilities, which are currently used by the applicant and his family. The applicant has expressed a desire to maintain their children's education within the existing school. Given the results of the GTAA with regard to the need, the lack of council provision, the identified need of the applicant on balance, 
it is considered that subject to the application satisfying a number of key material considerations, the principle of the development is considered acceptable. In terms of visual impact, whilst it is acknowledged that the site is readily visible from the A48, having regard to the single story scale of all the structures on site, the fluctuating levels of, of land within the site, uh, the site's context uh, with raised levels of screening could be provided and additional planting and mitigation could be secured that could provide um, a satisfactory visual impact. And officers are satisfied that this would not be such a significant impact to the overall character and appearance of the area to warrant refusal of the application. So as stated, additional conditions with regard to soft landscaping and the timber cladding of the immunity buildings would further mitigate any visual impact. In terms of highway safety, as noted earlier, vehicle access to the site would be gained via the existing driveway in the southeastern corner, which is shared with the former border waste site. The site layout plan indicates the provision of a driveway that would allow all vehicles accessing the site to pull off the carriageway prior to opening the gates and entering the land. The council's highway engineer has considered the proposed change of use, and although after concerns with the layout and management of the site, which matters that can be controlled through planning condition, offer no objection to the principle of the proposal. The development would not generate traffic manoeuvres that would be detrimental to highway safety or the capacity on the local network. Concerns have been raised by the public with regard to the highway safety implications arising as a result of the access being adjacent to the bridge of the M48 and the resulting shadow. This, this generates concealing the entrance, concealing, sorry, the entrance during the darkest times of the day. However, vehicles access in the site would be well lit and therefore visible even during darker hours. Whilst accepted that the development proposal would inevitably increase the number of vehicle movements generated, relative to the existing arrangement and extant consent, it must be balanced with the fact that the touring caravan pitches would only be used on an intermittent basis by transitioning, transiting members of the wider family. It's considered that the scale of the proposed development, the resulting chip trip generation, and the visibility av available from the access, that this would not prevent the proposal being so detrimental to highway safety and the free, free flow of traffic to warrant refusal. In terms of flooding, based on the development advice maps, maps set out with technical advice note 15, the site is outside of any allocated flood zone and is therefore unlikely to flood. The application is therefore considered compliant with the requirements of policies S12, SD3 and criterion E of policy H8. With regard to drainage, criterion G of policy H8 specifies in order to be approved, sites should be or can be served by adequate on-site services for water supply, power, drainage, sewage disposal, and waste disposal. As noted earlier, it's proposed to utilize the cesspool in respect of foul drainage. And notwithstanding the conditions set out in the officer's report, it is proposed to add a condition to ensure that a scheme for the disposal of foul and service water has been submitted to and agreed in writing with a local planning authority. This would allow for the appropriate technical details to be submitted. The Council's SUDS approving body, or SAB, has also confirmed that the works require SUDS consent prior to the commencement of development. In conclusion, based on the matters and their more detailed consideration, which are set out within the officer's report, the proposal is considered acceptable, having regard to local and national planning policy, as well as all other material planning considerations. Uh, finally, in addition to the supplementary drainage condition, it's proposed that the following issues are also conditioned, and this could be the wording agreed via the delegated panel, and this would include uh, a condition for the personalised consent to the applicant, uh, to amend the soft landscaping condition to include details of means of enclosure, to manage the number of units on site to comply with the development description, and to set a number of days for the touring caravans to be present on site. With that in mind, accordingly, the application is presented to members with a recommendation for approval. Thank you, Andrew. Councillor Brown, do you wish to go first? Uh, with your permission, Chair, I'll go after to uh, Councillor Murphy, because although it's in my ward, it's very close to Councillor Murphy's ward. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Do you want to speak, Councillor Murphy? Uh, yes, Chair. Um, I thought long and hard about this, um, and I've taken on board everything that the officers have said, but there's 
certain aspects of this development which, um, or proposed development, which uh, concern me. There's been a lot of excavation on the uh, site and I'm concerned that the land at the back uh, will now be unstable. And um, I think that we should be looking at, at, at that. The, the site looks as if it's been extended and I'd like that checked out at some stage. Um, and I think the, the look of the land as being unstable could possibly require some sort of, uh, of, um, of, of supporting wall or, or something at, at the back of it. There's a lot of debris there which could easily fall down if approval was given for uh, uh, caravans on, on that site. Um, I've heard everything that's been said about, uh, about the uh, uh, potential on, uh, on uh, traffic. Um, but my overall concern is for the amount of development proposed on that site, particularly when the touring vans are there. So on, so on, on balance, on balance, my view is that it would um, it would uh, be overdevelopment on the uh, site, and in its present form, um, unless I hear something in the uh, in the uh, discussion th th this afternoon, um, I don't feel at the moment that I would be able to support it. Thank you, Councillor Brown. Yes, thank you. Um, I think um, uh, I have heard also about the um, excavation that's gone on on the site. And if you go back to the photograph, I think, is it um, the one that shows the back of the site? Um, well, that shows sort of, mo well, I don't know whether you've got a bigger, that's probably the best picture. I don't really know. But the back of the site has, has got, um, has had quite a lot of, um, trees and vegetation and so forth. But when we went on site, um, there's, the, there's sort of skeleton trees left and also a pile of um, stones left on the site as, as well that you can, visually, you can visually see from the other side. And the history of the site is that um, border, it adjoins Border Waste Creek. And Border Waste um, Creek was... Um, a quarry site that wasn't given planning permission because of the fact that there was a concern about um, land slippage um, towards the motorway because if this stone was taken out and waste materials put in, there was a concern about um, slippage in that way. And my concern is now I, you can actually see these boulders and my main concern is for um, the residential safety of the um, applicants and um, their family in terms of the potential of a landslip in this, this particular area. The other area that I am concerned about is also um, specified uh, basically on page 73 and 74, which is to do with the H8 policy. And Mother Community Council have gone through that in, in detail to explain uh, why they think that um, it doesn't meet, meet that particular policy. And I think one of the main, main things is that um, the site overall is not large enough to house the proposed two park homes, two amenity blocks, four traveller pitches, plus the necessary vehicular parking and, and circulation turning areas. On this basis, we believe that the proposal represents a complete overdevelopment of the site, posing associated health and safety and visual amenity risks. Um, it is also pointed out in their response that not all of the area um, that is mentioned in the report actually is usable area because there's a flat plateau at, at the top. And if you go back to the uh, original plan, the site plan that we got the drawing, not that one, that one, yeah. That bit at the top there where the three-bedroomed park home is and the two-bedroomed home and the showers and the utility, that actually measures a uh, 16 point, because it's a scaled uh, drawing, one, one to 500. It measures 16.2 by 40.65. And obviously, yeah, you've got to consider looking at that di diagram that there's three 
bed parkome, two bed parkome. Um, there's also um, showers, utility block, um, and the four touring caravans. Also, um, because they are the park homes are in a sense the residential unit, there'll be a necessity under our parking policy for five parking places there as well. Now, highways actually um, talk about um, the idea of having a turning circle, and we, when we looked at the property in the obs, obs in the uh, earlier on today, which was zero zero. 898, we did actually consider the need for a turning circle. Now, this is normally part and parcel of, because obviously if you've got um, four touring caravans in there as well, and, and the site is the dimensions given on that plan, um, there isn't any room for manoeuvre and for the vehicles to come out in in uh, forward gear on a on a motorway that, um, sorry, an A road that is basically 50 stroke 60 when they're actually coming coming out of it. The officer's uh, report even admits um, that the site does appear to be crammed, which actually supports um, Councillor uh, Murphy's argument that um, the site is, is uh, overdeveloped. The other issue I'm concerned about is, um, again, I've said my main concern is residential safety for those using the motorway, sorry, the A48, and also um, residential safety for the applicants um, when they come in and out of the site. Um, uh, so I think that that's a concern. But also, um, although the uh, designing uh, gypsy, gypsy and traveller sites um, is actually a, a local authority guidance, all of the... Um, caravan model conditions and so forth, they actually mention the need for a six meter gap between um, caravans and mobile homes. And they do this because of the fact it says in the guidance that, sorry, sorry, it says in, it says in the, it says in the guidance that there should be a six meter, and in the easy read guidance, there should be a six meter gap and this is because of the fact that mobile homes are highly flammable um the history of this site is that we've we've already had um uh, a suspected arson matter in mid-november um this year so i think fire safety is 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 a concern and also if vehicles are moved in another area that aren't parked on the site um if when uh, touring caravans aren't there, then it could block the uh, access for emergency vehicles on the fire safety. So my concern about this is, you know, the safety aspects of, um, uh, of, um, so, sorry, can I? The safety aspects of the residents who are uh, going to be using that site and also the safety of uh, the road users as well, because in terms of this particular site, there has been, um, as I say, excavation which hasn't had uh, any planning permission. And uh, I think for that reason, um, consideration should be uh, given either to deferral or to look at arguing that this is overdevelopment. Now, I haven't actually, um, when it was a stable uh, site, I supported that, but I think there's a difference in terms of... Yes, she's lying. That loose form 
Don't come from the quarry. Don't come from the feet again. Don't you want to hear what some of us got to say? Yeah, go on. Sorry, sir. Go on. Go on, sir. Go on. Please, please give us some time. Yeah, so, sorry, can I, can oh, I just say, can oh, I just say, oh, Chairman, that I have just been talking about planning, planning policy in terms of policies H8 mm -hmm. and other policy, and so that, that's the only, only, uh, implicate, only things that I have actually uh, discussed. And we do this in the same in relation to other planning applications. We look at highway turning areas, which we've done already on this site. We look at, uh, at residential safety in general. And the planning rules are there to help the safety of um, uh, future residents and current residents. Thank you. Mr. Flynn, with, with 12 of us are here trying desperately to come to the right decision for you, and you are not helping us by keep continually giving outbursts. Now, all right, now I can, I've, I've, you know, I've gone with it so far, but if you continue, I will suspend this meeting and I'll have to ask you to leave. But I don't want to do that. I want you to hear all sides. But if you continue to interrupt this meeting, then I will suspend it. That's my right. All right, well. Just, just listen to it. Just listen to it out. Please. There's a good person. Right. Who's next? Matt Fee. Oh, do you want to go, Roger? Yeah. Sorry. Thank you, uh, Chair. We, to put it bluntly, have a duty of care towards the uh, the travelling community, and we have before us um, an application, and we have before us the comments of the officers have looked at this in great detail obviously with the uh, the sensitivity of um of what we're attempting to uh, to do here and we must have the um if you like um the uh, the, the guts to uh, address what we have before us and we have as it's uh, written down here this site for uh, approval and there's obviously uh, um, misgivings but I think there's enough here for us to be able to uh, um, progress with the applicant a sensible outcome to what we have before us, um, we must we must do it. As it as it's mentioned in here, we are we have got no sites whatsoever, and to put it bluntly, that is a, a disgrace. We're short of uh, eight sites, so we need to, if you like, bite the bullet. Um, see how we can make the best of this site for the people using it, the travellers, and for the residents of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the county so that we can all get some sort of harmony uh, back in, in our deliberations here. It's always difficult on the uh, planning committee, but we're here to make decisions, some of which are difficult, some of which are easy. Um, I, th I think we should go along with the uh, officers here and and sensibly negotiate any problems uh, that arise if indeed we do say yes to this application. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Roger. Craig? Yes, I just want to pick up on a few of the points that have been mentioned so far um, and just elaborate and show some clarity to some of the members. So yes, as uh, Council Harris just um, stated, the Council has done a Gypsy and Traveller assessment and we have outlined that there is a need for eight um, sites around the, around the county. Um, so there is definitely a need um, it's been established for Monmouthshire County Council to provide accommodation and homes for gypsy and travellers. So this site is a privately owned site. It's for uh, Mr Flynn, the applicant, has um, been part of that assessment and he has established a need, that there is a need for him to, to find a home within the county. This site would provide that need, so it would be filling some of our requirements and our duty of care that has been established. 
Um, the, policy, the, the site has been looked at in terms of our policy, H8. Um, we have gone through that um, policy and the development meets that criteria. It's in a sustainable location. The visual amenity is considered to be acceptable. It wouldn't cause any harm. And the highway safety aspect has been looked at. There's plenty of visibility from that site. Highways have no objection to the uh, access of the, of the site. Um, so there is no reason from a planning point of view which we can see to refuse this planning consent. There is an established need for this family to have a home within the county and this site does provide that. In terms of the amount of development um, that was raised by, by um, Councillor Brown, that is something that potentially we could look at. The application is for two park homes and for four touring caravans. If it's considered that that is too much, um, I've spoken to Mr Flynn, he would um, be willing to have the site just for the two park homes, which would be the need for himself and for his son. So it would be a personal consent for him to have a home within the county and to meet that need. So that if that's something that members could consider in terms of whether it's an overdevelopment of it or not. In terms of the excavation work at the back, um, Mr. Flynn has said that he hasn't done any work um, which doesn't need planning consent. The cutting down of trees and landscaping does not require planning consent, but if it is something that members are concerned with and do have consideration for, there could be a pre-commencement condition on this that we ensure that the st st stability of that bank at the back is safe and ensures that no rubble falls onto, onto the park homes and so the residents are safe. That is something that we could consider as a condition potentially. In terms of um, the Calavan model conditions, as outlined in the report, Environmental Health has had a look at this application. There would need to be a Calavan license gained, so there, there is that requirement for the, uh, for the applicant to look at. And also with regards to the documentation that was outlined in terms of the design of um, Gypsy and Traveller sites, this is a private owned family site, so it hasn't got that level of restriction and guidance. It is for the family to meet his own need. So there, there isn't that, that requirement. In paragraph uh, 1.15, it does say that that guidance is specifically for local planning authority sites. It's not for personalised sites. So in terms of all of these um, concerns and considerations, we have looked at them. We do feel that the planning merits of this development is acceptable, and that's why we are recommending approval. I think it's just balancing um, that against our duty of care that this, this will provide that need. Yeah, thank you, Craig. I've got a list of people. Uh, um, Matt, you're first. Thank you. Um, uh, we do have a duty of care, um, and we don't have other land available. Um, I personally would much prefer to see a dozen of these sites come forward, smaller scale sites, family units, than I would to see uh, a, a large scale site and force people to live cheek by jowl uh, um, simply because uh, they're from a traveller community or whatever it is. I think for me this, this sings to a family unit being located where they want to locate themselves um, and, uh, and at the end of the day, as Roger pointed out, we've got a recommendation to approve in front of us. I hear, and I wasn't on the site visit, so I apologise for that, but I, but I hear the concerns. Um, and I'll caveat the fact that I was on the site visit by the fact that we do have a recommendation to approve. The officers have been there, they've worked through this application at length, they've gone through all of the relevant policies, uh, and they themselves consider that, um, uh, with all the material planning considerations that, that, that are there, that this should be approved. Um, so, so, so in principle, what's been presented to us at the moment has officers' recommendation to approve. There is the argument within the room, or there's the position of the, in, within the room, is, is this overdevelopment? Um, and uh, Craig, you've said that, or you've alluded to the fact that uh, you've spoken to the applicant and the applicant would be willing to withdraw the touring caravan element of this application. Um, that in itself is a huge step for the applicant to take. Um, but for, for, for me, I think that um, I, I think that we've got to weigh up everything that's that's before us, weigh, weigh up everything, all, all the arguments that have been in the room. Um, and I can see and I hear that the overdevelopment element is quite a large sector of the concern. Um, so for me, if the applicant was willing to withdraw the the the, the four the four element, the, the four touring caravan parts, I'd be more than happy to to, to recommend approval. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, Giles. Yeah, th thank you, Chairman. I um, I think I concur with the, the, the last two speakers, and I 
I think I've, I've become quite familiar with circular 005 of, of, of late. Um, I appreciate the value of, of private sites uh, in meeting need. Um, the, the, the fact that with the site location sustainability is an issue that the circular directs us to consider as a matter of less material weight than if it were, say, for a dwelling in the, in, in the countryside. I also consider all the other uh, material um, matters that, that we have to think about, such as the Public Sector Equality Duty, Human Rights Act, um, the Housing Act and the, the duty to provide sites. Um, I am concerned, I'm glad that the applicant and, 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 and Matt has echoed my views about the four touring caravans, because I think with the, the, the two um, units, the, the day room, and I'm not quite sure what the, the square is on the, the side of the plan, sorry, behind the hedge. Yeah. Uh, right. Okay. But yeah, and I, I, I think if, if there were four touring caravans parked there, that could be quite a, a, a cluster given the, the raised level of the site. So if, if those could be removed, then, then great. But in terms of the other con concerns, um, I haven't heard anything that couldn't be dealt with satisfactorily by condition. So like the last couple of speakers, I'm, I'm happy to, to support the development. Thank you, Giles. Jess? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, just going to read out the little bit from the, the highway recommendations. It says the highway authority would request that if the planning authority are minded to approve the application, then suitably worded conditions are provided to control the safe operation of the access. The layout and number of parking spaces, a minimum of five car parking spaces, based on the council's adopted parking spaces, standard one space per bedroom, parking for four tour caravans and visitors, and a turning area suitable to accommodate the turning of towed touring caravans. They've given it to us there. If we have a condition which allows a safe parking and turning of the caravans, then great, there's absolutely nothing to object to in terms of overdevelopment. If the creation of that safe turning aspect means that you have to take away some of what was going to be developed on the site, that's covered by that condition as well. This idea of overdevelopment is, uh, to me, uh, uh, just a, a non-starter, especially with those conditions already fitted in there. So I think we should just get on with it and approve it. So. Yeah, I think, um, uh, you know, I think it's not so much, um, my, my concern is obviously, um, you know, to make sure that there's uh, safety going in and out of the site and also, um, you know, safety for the, um, uh, for the residents on the site, you know, because I'm, I'm concerned about both. And, uh, you know, if, if the application is, is just going to be the three-bedroomed and the two-bedroomed unit on its own, um, then, because it's already got facilities within it, within it um, for, um, you know, sort of showers or whatever uh, within it. I think, I think that would certainly um, help deal with some of the concerns that we've got with regard to overdevelopment. And presumably the uh, pre-commencement uh, con condition would be um, to make sure that the um, back bit was safe in terms of possibly a retaining wall or something to support that at the back because I am concerned about, you know, I've been on meetings with uh, Welsh Highways about this site and about slippage and so forth and I am concer concerned about the quarrying and the because you could actually see those those stones on and I wouldn't want anything to happen to the applicant's family who, who are um, resident underneath in the same way I wouldn't want it to happen to 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 anyone um, I think I think that would help in terms of the uh, con conditions um, I've noticed that uh, you've mentioned uh, I think there needs to be a, another condition which is about um, uh, to make sure that it's actually a residential use only so that um, uh, no, no commercial activities whatsoever shall take place on the land, including external storage. And I think that is something that is part and parcel of um, conditions found elsewhere for um, these type, type of sites. And it makes sure that it's residential only use. And um, also, because we've had issues with regard to um, grit and dirt on the road, um, you know, and obviously there has been a, a traffic incident 
to do with that on the junction of, of Crick very recently and drains being blocked. I think it's important to have a, a construction statement for this uh, particular site as well because the, there's quite a considerable amount of mud on the site. And, um, you know, if that mud gets on a, a national speed limit road, there are um, slippage um, dangers there for the for the traffic nearby. And um, I think uh, the local residents have been clearing the drains recently because of the um, e excavation um, that has recently uh, gone on. So I think I think we'd, we'd need those um, other conditions put on as well. I think you've men mentioned about a personal consent, which again is a precedent um, found on other sites, um, uh, namely the old telephone exchange um, and, uh, you know, so if, if basically we're talking about the three-bedroom three park home and the two-bedroom park home, I think that would be fair enough. And I think there'd be room then for the um, parking spaces which are, are required um, within the sort of curtilage of the um, uh, residential um, property and, and proper spacing of everything. I don't know whether uh, Councillor Murphy wishes to add anything more. I think it's been covered by everybody else, Chair. I would only be repeating what other people have said. Do you want to wind up, Councillor Matthew? No, only to say that I, I did move it, Chair, in the point of order, I did move it did. With, 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 with the um, amended amendment that the touring caravan element be removed. Yeah. Ooh, how many more and just to give that clarity, I, was, I wanted to, didn't know whether you wanted to test that. Uh, right, I, th I, think Giles, I think Giles may have seconded it. Yeah, I think he did. We've just got one or two more speakers quickly. Yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. I, all I want to say is this: that uh, you know, the, what I what I think we should let the two park homes go on the site first, and then see what uh, room is available then for touring caravans. And I, I say up to four touring caravans. I mean, it's reasonable. It's, it's certainly a reasonable site for two residential caravans. But I, I think when they ought to be sited first before it's determined how many tourists. Yeah, sorry, Chair. Um, if if we've we've got an application before us, which is the, all of that plus the the towing vans. If the towing vans are removed, isn't that a, a new ap application? I, um, I I don't think so, but I think we need we need to clarify that. So in terms of yeah, just clarifying what members have discussed and what the, the way you're discussing things, um, there's considered to be no development of the site, so we're now considering two park homes on the site. Um, it doesn't need new notification. It, we, we're, we're planning on conditioning the number of caravans in any case, so we would condition there would be two park homes sited on the site, so if there's anything else, then um, the applicant would have to make an, another application, which would be for, um, for consideration by the council. So it doesn't need to do anything else we can condition the number of caravans we've also talked about conditioning the personal use of the site to meet mr flynn's need and his son's need so that would be conditioned um we've talked about um the potential to condition that it would be for residential use only now this condition is up for discussion um this is for planning consent for residential use only so if there is any other use any business activity or anything else on the site then that would need its own planning consent in its own right so we would have the right to take enforcement action against that so personally i don't think that is needed but that's something for members to consider um, there's also talk about a construction management plan um, again this is something that could be added to the to the consent however um, these park homes do come in usually either as one or as two pieces which are slotted together so there isn't much construction um, but again that's something that, that could be considered but on oh, sorry the excavation so if we could condition that if it is um, the we that the applicant submits information or is investigated that that's um, bank is stable and would not cause any harm to the amenity and lives of the occupants so I think that that would be a suitable condition Right, Matthew, you've moved it, and some of the Jim seconded it, I think, did you? Oh, no, I'm happy to say. Oh, it. Roger's done it. So we've now got a proposal for its acceptance and a seconder. Will all those show, please, for its acceptance? Eight. Eight. 
Those against? No, and we're abstaining. I'm abstaining. Right, the application is approved, subject to all the conditions, which I'm sure you've heard. Okay. No, no, whoops, you're not allowed to speak. Just be grateful for what's just happened. You're not helping yourself. Thank you very much. All right. All right. Good night. Sorry for <laughs> Good night. <laughs>